Recording. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Select Budget Committee meeting. Today is October 15th, 2021. This is Friday and the final day three of three of our uh, central staff issue identification. I'm Teresa Mosqueda, chair of the committee. Will the clerk please call the roll? Perez? Here. Lewis? Present. Morales? Here. Peterson? Here. Sawant? Present. Strauss? Present. Gonzalez? Here. Herbold? And Chair Mosqueda? Present. Eight present. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Clerk, colleagues, thank you again for joining us today for day three of the uh, central staff issue identification, identifying various issues for topic, discussion, questions, um, possible amendment ideas for later that central staff has flagged for us from the proposed budget that we received from the mayor's office about two weeks ago. I wanna thank central staff for all of the work they've done and uh, thank you, all of you for your participation throughout the last two days. And we will get through today and make sure to adjourn uh, before 5 p.m. today with uh, the intent to take a full recess as well between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Our morning session will include the Department of Transportation overview, the alternatives to police response and the criminal legal system as a, um, a topic as well this morning. We will take a recess at 1 p.m. and we will come back at 2 p.m. to conclude our issue identification looking at the Seattle Police Department. If there's no objection, today's agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. I want to um, just ask that uh, we, I'm gonna try to make sure I have the right link here for um, public comment. As we open public comment here today, I wanna remind folks that um, we do have the intent to hear from everybody on my list. As I check in with the clerks to make sure I'm looking at the right sheet, I see 28 people signed up for public comment. Is that is that correct? If so, uh, I want to make sure. Okay, thank you so much. I want to make sure that we get a chance to hear from everybody this morning. I will give you a one minute to provide public comment this morning. Please remember that you have ten seconds chime that will, will that will air when your time is about to conclude. So please do conclude your remarks and send any additional comments to us at council at seattle.gov. I'm going to call two names at a time, so that way we're uh, teeing up two names, and then uh, you will hear your name you will hear you have been unmuted. That is your indication to hit star six on your line. Again, hit star six so that your line can officially be unmuted and double check that your phone is also not on mute on its own end. Thanks again for dialing in. Once you've concluded your uh, comments, please do hang up, disconnect, and go ahead and listen back in at the Seattle channel live stream or any of the listen in options provided on today's agenda. Thank you so much for dialing in to provide comments today on the 2022 proposed budget and our deliberations here. The first two speakers, and the public comment period is now open, the first two speakers are Howard Gale and Nation Burns. Good morning, Howard. Good morning, Howard Gale. City Attorney's Office recently settled a lawsuit for the SPD abuse of an elderly white man for $250,000 and a meeting with SPD Chief Diaz. However, for the SPD execution style murder of Pacific Islander Ayosea Falatogo, leaving two children fatherless, the city just settled for $515,000 and no meeting. In both these cases, our police accountability system deemed the SPD actions, quote, lawful and proper, unquote. Clearly, this council remembers little about accountability and justice post George Floyd. Our current police accountability budget is $10.8 million for 2022. This means taxpayers pay twice for police abuse, once to cover it up and a second time to compensate the victims. The solidarity budget demands that police accountability be removed from the SBD. We must go beyond that and also divest from a failed accountability system that bills taxpayers twice for abuse. Go to seattlestop.org to find out how we can do this if the council fails to act. Thanks, Howard, and good morning, Nation. Nation's gonna be followed by Trayvon uh, Thompson Wiley. Good morning. I'm not seeing Nashawn Burns on the screen here. We've lost a caller. Okay, we'll come back to you if you're able to dial in. Trayvon, good morning. And good um, after Trayvon will be Scott Bonjukin. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Trayvon. I'm a resident of District 2. 
I've called in plenty of times. Most of the council members already probably know my first and last name by now. Um, and I've called in mostly talking about divesting from police as a practice and investing in community-based holistic approaches to public health and safety. I want to try something different today. I want to share with you what areas of the budget we could be funded with divested SPD dollars. So, for instance, the SPD budget is looking like it's going to be $47.8 million more because there's a bunch of responsibilities that were not taken out uh, from the previous budget. So here's what we can use with that $47.8 million. We could create nearly 2,000 units of permanent supported housing for in-house people. We could actually spend $120, it costs about $120,000 to train a cop and pay for a new cop every single year we can actually put together some actual programs that will help families. We can also show that Indigenous Lives Matter by... Thank you again, Trevana. Uh, it looks like we have Nishan back on the line here, so I will go to Nishan and then Scott. Well, Scott, I see you unmuted. Hi. What? Sorry yeah, about let's that. go ahead and go... Name... Oh, <laughs> sorry yeah, to speak cool. over My name's Nishan Burns. I'm Great. a renter in District 2. <laughs> I want to speak in support of a few demands from the people's budget. Uh, first, relating to police budgeting, the council should reject Mayor Durkin's proposed $13 million increase in funding for SPD. Uh, this money would be totally unnecessary and would in part go to more hiring bonuses for new cops. You know, they're some of the most highly paid public employees in the city. They don't need more funding. Uh, local right-wing media have whipped certain people into a rabid frenzy about imaginary skyrocketing crime rate. Um, following Seattle government defunding the police, which unfortunately didn't happen in any meaningful way. Uh, you do not want to bend to conservative media. And following most of the council's total refusal to support the demands coming out of the mass protest movement last summer, people are going to notice if you just walk back with the concessions that you did make. I also want to emphasize the importance of what will actually alleviate crime, which is more funding for social services. But of course, taking $13 million alone from the police budget isn't going to be enough. And what we need is a massive expansion of the big business tax that the tax Amazon movement won last year. $120 million, most of which will go to affordable housing. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Scott. Thanks for waiting. After Scott will be BJ last. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Scott Bonjukian, and I am promising on behalf of the Lit I-5 Steering Committee and our coalition of community partners, I am promising on the SDOT budget. We continue to request that the City Council fund the Downtown Street Network study that was recommended several years ago by the Imagine Greater Downtown program. The Downtown Street Network study is necessary to understand all of our options for mobility and placemaking as we recover from the pandemic. Lit I-5 is also asking that this Downtown Street Network study be done collaboratively with the Washington State Department of Transportation to look at the relation between our streets and the ramps connecting to Interstate 5. Many of these ramps are a direct cause of transit delays and pedestrian safety hazards because of the amount of traffic they induce. Some of the ramps also hamper opportunities to live the freeway long term. The public is behind the idea. This year, a scientific poll of Seattle voters found that 77% of voters uh, favor relocating freeway ramps in downtown if it can help address congestion and safety problems. Our team is available at uh, www.litI5.org should you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect timing. BJ, you are followed by Gordon Pidelford. Good morning, BJ. My name is BJ. Good morning. My name is BJ Lath. I'm a Ballard resident. I'm calling in support of the solidarity budget and defunding SPD in the municipal courts by 50%. Starting with the 1973 Kansas City Preventative Crime Patrol Experiment, study after study has shown that patrol slash police presence does not make communities safer. Meeting, people basic, meeting people's basic needs makes communities safer. Police presence has no impact on crime rate. Crime rate. Police presence, though, does hurt the community. I mean, a recent study published in The Lancet found that reform efforts, including de-escalation training, implicit bias training, body cameras, and diverse police forces have failed to reduce police violence rates or racial disparities in police violence. This failure of reform is why the Center for Police Inequity found SPD still uses force against Black and Indigenous community members at disproportionate rates by the decade of the consent decree and additional training. SPD, and so this isn't about reimagining public safety because SPD does not make the community safe. Meeting people's basic needs makes the community safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next person is Gordon, followed by um, Penny O'Gary. Good morning, Gordon. 
Good morning, Council Members. My name is Gordon Bedelford with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, here to talk about the transportation budget. As you know, safety for people walking and rolling is more urgent than ever, given the sharp uptick in traffic thefts this year, which disproportionately impact people of color, low-income people, unhoused folks, people with disabilities, elders, and really all of our community members. And unfortunately, Seattle's on track to have the worst year of traffic fatalities and injuries in over a decade. So we really need to do more to reach Vision Zero. Luckily, SDOT's Vision Zero program is focused on proven methods to increase safety, and they do so through a strong equity framework, which is why we're proposing increasing the Vision Zero budget. Please maintain the mayor's proposed spend plan for the vehicle licensing fee and increase the commercial parking tax. Both of these efforts would go to increase the Vision Zero budget and help keep everyone safe on our streets. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, Penny, you are up next, followed by Terry Holm. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Penny, and I live in District 6. I'm calling in support of the Solidarity Budget. I've lived in a vibrant neighborhood in Green Lake for over 25 years where neighbors know and care for each other. The people across the street moved into assisted living and sold their home to a real estate developer in Arizona. The house has been empty since June. Last night, the owner arrived to find that all the electrical wiring had been stripped and the house obviously occupied by several people. None of the neighbors were aware of this. Now the house is boarded up for an indefinite amount of time. The house next door has been vacant for well over seven years. All the policing in the world won't change the fact that many people in our community need help, including permanent supportive housing, and will do what they need to do to find shelter and cash. Police don't keep us safe. Meeting people's basic needs keeps us safe. Policing is like a dirty bandage covering a festering wound. Not only do police not heal the wound, they cause further infection. Research shows that increasing community service. Thank you, Penny. And please send in the rest of those comments um, to council at seattle.gov. Appreciate you dialing in this morning. Terry, followed by Blair um, Perleman. Good morning, Terry. Just hit star six one more time. Looks like you're still muted over here. And I'll also note, Blair, you are up next after Terry, uh, but it has you listed as not present. So if you can dial in, we'll come back to you. Terry, just hit star six one more time. Um, make sure make sure you're not hitting pound. We had that happen a few days ago. So uh, star six and I'll look for you to come off mute on my end. As Terry's doing that, can we tee up Sam, please? Sam Dick will be followed by Sylvie Reynolds. And Terry, I'll keep you on the on the screen here just to look for you to come off of mute. Again, star six, Terry. Oh, Terry, I thought I saw you come off mute and then go back on one more time. If you can hit star six. <clears throat> Hi, Terry, can you hear me? Oh, I guess. I got there on. We go. This is Terry Holm. I live. I, yeah, I live in District Three. Um, I'm calling about the Lake Washington Boulevard uh, South Keep Moving Street Program. I'm asking for your support for Council Member Morales' current initiative to add and provide $200,000 for the 2022 proposed budget, enabling uh, SDOT to proceed with an equitable engagement and outreach with the objective of finalizing a plan for permanent improvement from Mount Baker Beach to Stewart Park. Adopting funding at this time will be in keeping with your unanimously supported June 2021 amendment to CB 120093 version 2, wherein the council committed to the future funding of this work. The city's COVID-19 Keep Moving Streets program on Lake Washington Boulevard has been an enormous success over the last year and a half and has demonstrated the importance of reevaluating this exceptional waterfront park can be used to its greatest potential. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, and next we have Sam. Good morning, Sam. Sam will be followed by Sylvie Reynolds. Hi, Sam. To star six one more time. Hi, can you hear me? Now I can, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna, my name is Sam Dick. I'm gonna be speaking on the 2021-22 budget. I am a safety supervisor for the Metropolitan Improvement District. The MID is part of the downtown 
Seattle Association and consists of a clean, safe, and outreach team and parks. Over the past year, there has been a significant increase in crime, homelessness in downtown Seattle. This has had a major impact on our clean, safe parks and outreach operations. Many of our ambassadors have been threatened and assaulted. The goal of the Metropolitan Improvement District is to create a healthy, vibrant urban core. This has been very difficult in our current environment. We need more police, housing, treatment, and services for us to fulfill our goal and keep our ambassadors safe. I deeply urge you to create a budget that prioritizes safety and compassion for all. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Sylvie, good morning. You are going to be followed by Valerie Sh Schroldick. Hi, this is Sylvie. I live in District 6. I'm calling in support of Council Member Morales' proposals for projects within District 2, including Lake Washington Boulevard and MLK Junior Boulevard Safety. Um, three community members have been um, tragically killed this summer on the street, and um, I think that SDOT should increase its Vision Zero funding, including sidewalks, and um, I also um, urge the levy to please um, um, restart the projects on page 37 of the COVID impact assessment that are still um, have not been restarted yet and um, to follow through on their um, principles of success, um, including its um, strong foundation on equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Valerie will be followed by Tamara Wilson. Good morning, Valerie. Star six to unmute. Thank we. Good morning, Valerie Floret from District Two. The police accountability budget for 2022 is $10.8 million just for the core partners, the CPC, the OPA, and the OIG. Recent events show how urgently we need to reallocate these funds. The OIG investigator whistleblower complaint and the OPA's failure to fa fairly investigate or censure SPD for violence in the 2020 protests were reported in the South Seattle Emerald, as was a dismal community engagement event this week with the federal monitors. The investigations done by the OPA under OIG's oversight are now all under question, including inv investigations into fatal shootings by SPD. Why should we fund a system that rubber stamps biased investigations to protect police misconduct. The city should defund this failed system by at least 50%. Um, for more information about a proposed legislation for a civilian accountability system based on best practice from other U.S. Thank you very much. Please send the rest of your comments in, Valerie, to council at seattle.gov. Uh, Peter Condit will be followed by um clara Hello? cantor oh. hi is this tamar hey tamar please go ahead yes hi all right thank you hello council members my name is tamar wilson i'm a district two resident in beacon hill and a black lives matter community organizer and i'm speaking to you today in support of the people's budget which stands in solidarity with the solidarity budget since 2014 the people's budget has fought to ensure that working class people and the organizations in seattle have their needs and concerns brought to the fore and provided for not just big business and corporate interests which dominate so much of the city last year thanks to leadership of council members who want and groups like socialist alternative among others the blm movement in the city was able to win a historic tax on amazon to fund sorely needed community initiatives like affordable housing and a local green new deal these weren't only concrete wins for the movement for racial and economic justice, but indeed major wins for Seattleites of all types, being that the majority of our population are renters with over 60,000 Seattle renters owing rental debt to the landlord. And we've seen the devastating effects of the climate crisis greatly intensify in the last year alone. To this end, it's absolutely untenable that as rent skyrocket, as home prices skyrocket, as unprecedented heat waves caused by the climate crisis Tamara, if you could send in the rest of your comments as well, um, appreciate you dialing in today. And it's council at seattle.gov. Peter, good morning. Peter will be followed by Clara. Good morning. This is Peter Condit in District 6. I'm calling in support of defunding Seattle Police by at least 50%. This can be done by following the recommendations of the Solidarity Budget. 
<clears throat> Last month, on September 17th, I was approached by SPD Sergeant Hill, who decided he wanted to speak to me without a mask on, indoors, from within three feet. I had to put myself at risk by telling a man with a gun to follow COVID precautions. He didn't even have a mask with him. Why are masks not standard equipment for SPD at this point? SPD's structure values officer comfort and pay over public safety. Sergeant Hill was on the job, engaging in an activity known to contribute to the spread of COVID. Council needs to take power, funding, and position authority away from SPD to keep us safe. By defunding SPD, Council can increase funding for other things, including Vision Zero and sidewalks. Also, Council should ask SDOT to collect street safety data and crash data instead of leaving that job to SPD. Defunding SPD is a commitment to meeting Thank you, Peter. Please send in the rest of your comments as well. Clara, good morning. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Hi, this is Clara Cantor. I'm a resident of District 2, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Mass Coalition. Um, the Mass Coalition is in support of the Solidarity Budget, and I'm here commenting specifically on transportation and asking Council to fund... We just lost you, Clara. Um, we lost you after asking counsel. Can you still hear me? Might have gone on mute on your uh, actual phone device. So we'll see if we can get you back on the line here. <clears throat> okay, great. I saw council member Morales' screen moving, so I know I'm not frozen. Uh, that's a good thing. So Clara, when we, uh, when we get you back on the line, we'll keep you unmuted and we will come back to you. Oh, sorry that our technology got disconnected here. Um, Shamir, Shamir, you will be followed by Sean Flynn. Good morning, Shamir. Shamir, if you could hit star six to unmute. Hello. Hello. Hey, sorry about that. No problem. Hi. Um, my name is Shamir Tana. I'm a district. Uh, I'm a resident of District Seven. Um, I'm calling in support of the solidarity budget and defunding the police, Seattle Police Department. Defund SPD means valuing Black lives, Indigenous lives, and the lives of our houseless neighbors, and truly investing in them. The budget is the ultimate accountability me mechanism, and it is in your hands. I hope to see you propose amendments that defund SPD by doing the following, as outlined by the solidarity budget: decrease. SPD's funding and position authority for sworn officers to 750 members. And all new SPD spending on hiring bonuses, technology, buildings, and weapons. And transfer community service officers and other civilian positions out of SPD. By doing this, council can provide permanent funding for community-led solutions. These are many, there are many well-researched and important ideas in the solidarity budget. For example, housing for all and Seattle Green New Deal. Thank you for your time. Thanks for dialing in today. Uh, Sean Pullen will be followed by Lou Bond. Lou, it has you listed as not present. So if you are able to dial in um, before the end of our public comment, we'll come back to you. Sean, good morning. Just hit star six on your end and we should be good to go. Great. Hi, good morning. My name is Sean Pullen. I'm a safety and hospitality supervisor for a Metropolitan Improvement District. I've been working with the company for a little over eight years. In that time, I've seen the police presence in downtown dwindle down to next to nothing. The results of that have caused more assaults on our ambassadors and to the general public. <clears throat> Unless it's a violent crime, police will no longer respond. And because of this, we have had to adjust our services to keep everyone safe. <clears throat> this includes pairing up all our ambassadors <clears throat> so that they are not out in the city alone. We no longer work past dust because it is just too dangerous. And also, often several times a week, we are focused or forced to move our ambassadors to safer parts of the city to keep them away from danger after an assault or shooting. I am here today to request the city prioritize needed investments into public safety and the budget. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for calling in today. Lou, it still shows you as not present, Lou Bond. So we are gonna move on to Sonia. Good morning, Sonia. Sonia will be followed by- Hi, Matt. good morning. Good morning. Okay, hi. 
Uh, it's Sonia Ponath. I'm a working mom in District 3 speaking in favor of the people's budget. I want to know why we uh, have more funding for police in this budget, like hiring bonuses. Really, we should be uh, funding public showers, bathrooms, safe parking, sewage, and garbage for our unhoused neighbors. They're forced to live in their vehicles. All over Seattle, people are screaming about the homeless, homelessness problem and, and to do something about it. We must do more than provide funding to sweep homeless people and their meager possessions away. Is that what the police are going to do? Again and again, the Democratic establishment has failed to hold the police accountable. What's really needed is an elected community oversight board with full powers over the police. That means real control over hiring, firing, budgeting, and subpoena power. We just had, if we'd had uh, Democratic structures like that in place during the George Floyd protests, would people have been, police have been so emboldened to use illegal weapons on all those peaceful protesters? There's not been one officer held accountable for the 28 killings in the last decade. It's shameful and unacceptable for those grieving families. Let's have a Thank you very much. Uh, if you can send in the rest of your comments, that would be great. Max, good morning. Max will be followed by Michael Malini. Good morning. My name is Max Rappaport, and I live in District, uh, District 3 with my partner and, in a few weeks, our baby. Um, I'm calling this morning in support of the Solidarity Budget, specifically its commitment to a safer, more walkable city. I live just a few blocks away from Rainier Avenue a street constantly in battle with Aurora for the distinction of deadliest street in Seattle. Where I live, near the soon-to-be Judkins Park light rail station, there's a nearly half-mile gap between crosswalks on Rainier. In between these streets, folks trying to catch a bus regularly decide to dart across the five lanes of traffic rather than walk nearly a mile out of their way to get to a crosswalk. Over the past few years, the city has punted on much-needed safety improvements time and time again, and the mayor's proposed budget puts us on a 300-year course just to get sidewalks built citywide, which is pathetic. I support the solidarity budget in part because of its commitment to making Seattle a safe place for folks to get around on foot and by bike, and even more so because it rightly targets funding cuts at SPD and its bloated budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Michael will be followed by Judith Runstad. Good morning, Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Molini. I'm a renter in District 3, <clears throat> calling in support of the Solidarity Budget and for the Council to follow up on its commitment to defund SPD, including ending all new SPD spending on hiring, bonuses, technology, buildings, and weapons, and reducing SPD's budget to reflect the transfers of 911 and parking enforcement out of SPD and the Mayor's plan staffing reductions, as well as transferring community service officers and other civilian positions out of SPD. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Judith will be followed by Anna Williams. Good morning, Judith, just star six to unmute. And Judith, I see you still muted on my end. If you could hit star six. Colleagues, we are at the 10 o'clock hour, but we only have three other folks signed up to provide public testimony. So if there's no objection, I'm going to extend the public comment for the next uh, four minutes to, to get through everyone. And Judith will keep you uh, teed up there so that you can come off mute, star six. Hearing no objection, the public comment will be extended to get through the rest here. And Judith, I'll keep you on the screen here. Again, star six to come off mute. After Judith is Anna Williamson, um, Amarinta Torres, and Jason Skies. And the other two people that I have listed as wanting to speak but are not present are Jim Williamson and Sean Jackson. So we'll do Anna, Amarinthia, and Jason. Judith, I'll keep you on the line here. I'm still seeing you unmuted on my end, so star six. Good morning, Anna, if you could hit star six as well. We'll get you up in the queue. Great, go ahead, Anna. Good morning, hi, I'm Anna and I'm a resident of D4 and I'm calling in support of the Solidarity Budget and defunding Seattle Police Department. Defunding SPD means valuing Black lives, Indigenous lives, and the lives of our houseless neighbors. In my professional life, I work as a personal trainer. And when I first began training, I thought that because I was the quote-unquote professional with the title, I knew what was best for my clients. I prescriptively told clients how to move, what to eat. After all, I knew what was best, right? How did that method of training go? Well, the people who were most similar to me, the upper class, thin white ladies, got the most out of training. Our lived experiences were the most similar so I could best serve these folks. And the rest of my clients, I'm really sad to say that they didn't get the service they deserved, far from it. What I've learned is that no matter how well my intentions are to help, I am not the expert. 
people, when given the support and resources to thrive, know what is best for them. My beautiful city council members, you work your butts off. I know you are well-intentioned, and you are not the experts here. The solidarity budget is a literal manual. Thank you. Um, Amarinthia, uh, let's tee you up and just hit star six. Judith, I'm still looking at your tile here. Just need you to hit star six, and we will get you up to speak. Uh, okay, I think I hit it. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Amarinthia. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Hi, thanks so much for the extra time, uh, council members. Um, good morning, my name is Amarinthia Torres and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition in a Gender-Based Violence. We support the ongoing work to build meaningful alternatives to the criminal legal system, such as the recent Community Safety Capacity Building Program, among others. We believe survivors of physical abuse, coercion, domestic violence, stalking, sex trafficking, rape, and sexual assault need alternatives that are specifically tailored to the unique harms they've experienced and the ongoing danger that they face. Gender-based violence programs have a wealth of knowledge in this area. We've long offered a range of innovative supports outside of the criminal legal system to protect survivor safety and hold people who cause harm accountable, including survivor-driven advocacy. Some examples include creative and steady safety planning when a survivor does not want to report to police, prevention programs like equitable relationship classes and building a culture of consent, enlisting trusted community members to intervene when violence occurs, advocacy with survivors about what repairing harm looks like to them. Gender-based violence programs need financial investments to continue survivor-driven mobile advocacy and to keep innovating on these alternatives. Thank you, Amarinthia. If you want to send in the rest of your comments, that would be wonderful. And Jason, good, <laughs> good morning. Good morning. My name is Jason Sykes. I'm a resident of uh, I just wanted to uh, echo a couple comments that for Jason, could you speak up just a little bit? Yes. Okay, great. That's better. Yeah. Hi. Again, my name is Jason Sykes. I'm a resident of District 4, um, and I wanted to speak on the police accountability budget uh, uh, items in the upcoming city budget. Uh, adding them up, it looks like we're going to budget $10.5 million for an accountability system that very few people seem satisfied with. Again, at the very least, I would want the council to deeply look into the whistleblower complaint that showed that the Office of Inspector General is prioritizing its political relationships with the Office of Police Accountability and intentionally telling employees not to create written records that reflect poorly on the Office of Police Accountability, which is crazy because that is the job of the OIG is to investigate and hold the Office of Police Accountability accountable. Um, it's a crazy system. It should be completely redesigned, but at the very least, it needs to be held to account before you fund it again. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And Judith, I still see you listed as muted. Uh, we are gonna give you one more chance trying to get you off mute, star six. Sorry if it's frustrating over there. I know some folks have been hitting pound six, so I'm just gonna keep you up for another second. Okay, Judith, I still see you muted. So I'm gonna go ahead and move us on. Please do send in your comments to council at seattle.gov. Colleagues, that does conclude today's public comment and we're gonna head right on into items of business as we have a packed agenda for this Friday. Madam Clerk, could you please read item number one into the record? And as we agenda that, item, my apologies, agenda item one, Seattle Department of Transportation for briefing and discussion. Thanks, Madam Clerk. Uh, so welcome, Calvin Chow from Central Staff. Again, welcome back to the stage here. Uh, Ali Panucci and I see Councilmember Peterson as Chair of Transportation um, on the line here as well. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. We will have uh, Calvin begin some of the initial comments, if that sounds good, and then we'll have you be the first to um, offer some comments and thoughts as well. You know what? Um, colleagues, I'm going to switch this up <laughs> a little chair's prerogative here. The presentations for today are all very long um, and really appreciate the work that uh, central staff have done on these. So um, 
for today, I'm going to ask if council members who do have purview over these um, specific areas, if you did have any uh, opening comments, you're welcome to do that because if we have questions throughout, I just want to make sure that we got a chance to hear from you first. So if you don't mind, Calvin, I'm going to ask council member Peterson, if there's anything you'd like to, to say as opening comments, as we get into department of transportation, you're welcome to do that. And of course, uh, we will defer to you first for questions, but um, there may be some questions throughout. So I don't want to miss the chance to get you in for some opening comments. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. I'll, I'll, um, I think we'll just, if it's okay with you, we can just have uh, Calvin Chow start his presentation. I think I'll have uh, comments when we get to the issue ID section of it. That's great. Thank okay, you. thank you, Councilmember Peterson. And then when we get to those issue IDs, of course, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts first, and then get other folks' thoughts on the issue IDs. But um, Calvin, in your in your presentation, is it okay if folks do have questions throughout if they ask you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, Okay, thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Calvin. Let's take it away on Seattle Department of Transportation. Council members, good morning. My name is Calvin Shaw with Council Central Staff, and today I'll be re reviewing the proposed SDOT budget, and my colleague, Patty Wigram, will be managing the slides. Uh, my presentation today will be on a high-level summary of my issue paper, which is also attached to the agenda. And so I thought we should start with an overview of SDOT's proposed budget. Patty, if you could, next slide, thank you. So the first slide summarizes SDOT's operating expenses only. And you can see that the 2022 proposed budget is about 15% higher than the 2021 proposed or adopted budget at 318 million. And there are two main factors for this increase. Um, the first is in mobility operations, which is row A. And this BSL increased, increased by 26% um, because it includes 19 million of additional transit service purchases from Metro that are part of the STBD Proposition 1 transit measure. The other major factor is in row F, which is the new parking enforcement BSL, which reflects the transfer of the parking enforcement division from SBD to SDOT. So that is 18.4 million of general fund. If you exclude these two adjustments, then SDOT's operating budget is really a continuation of 2021 levels of service. I'd also note that the budget does not restore some operational cuts that were made during the 2021 budget, about 5.9 million that were scattered among a number of different SDOT programs. Next slide, please. This slide shows the capital appropriations uh, for SDOT spending. And as a reminder, capital spending can typically vary from year to year based on the actual project schedules. So the fluctuations aren't necessarily a result of policy changes. The 2022 proposed budget is 11% higher than last year's budget, uh, about 400 million for capital. Uh, the most significant proposals are 5.2 million for bridge repair and 2.4 million to restart the Center City Connector Streetcar project. And both of these items will be discussed in the issues section. In total, including all capital and operating costs, SDOT's proposed budget is almost 13% more than the 2021 adopted budget at about 718 million. At the very bottom, you'll Sorry, see the- Just very briefly, Calvin, um, I wanted to just uh, remind folks um, the uh, the chat function doesn't necessarily work as the best feature on this um, remote uh, 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 system that we have here. So I'm gonna ask for folks to let me know, are you hearing any feedback? Um, and if so, if there's anything that we can do on the technical side, some folks are hearing some static feedback. Okay, well, we will just keep our ear on it. And if you have any technical concerns or audio concerns, let us know um, and we'll try to get those fixed. Sorry, I just wanna make sure it's coming through loud and clear on Seattle channel and for all of our colleagues. So we'll look for a thumbs up if you're okay. If you'll bear with me for a moment, I will move to a... We're gonna, we're gonna go with high tech headphones with a microphone. Are folks following along at home here? Thanks so much. Bear with us one second. And thank you for alerting us, council members. That sounds better to me. There was a high pitched something going on and now it's gone. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing multiple nods and I'm hearing that. Council member Peterson and I did not hear it. So we might need to get our hearing check, but um, other people apparently did. Council members, can you hear me now? Is that better? I think it's good. Could you pull the microphone just a little closer to you? Is that better? 
I think so. Yeah, I'm seeing nods. Okay, Calvin, thanks for thanks for your your fix there. That really <laughs> so sorry apologies. to interrupt you. That's fine. Um, we, I was talking about the position list at the very bottom. Um, you can see that the department is actually increasing the number of positions by about 13% more, or excuse me, by about 16% um, more. Uh, this includes a total of 157.5 FTEs uh, that are new to SDOT. 120 of these are related to the parking enforcement officers. About 24 are conversions of temporary term limited positions to permanent positions that would otherwise expire in 2022. There are six and a half FTEs that are new positions with no new budget appropriations required or requested and uh, using funding from within the existing program budgets. And there are seven FTEs that are new positions with new budget appropriations. Next slide, please. This slide shows SDOT's revenues and resources that support SDOT's expenses. Uh, as you can see in row O, the general fund contribution to SDOT is increased. And again, this is primarily due to the parking enforcement transfer. As you may recall, the Move Seattle levy requires a minimum general fund contribution to SDOT to ensure no supplantation. The minimum requirement for 2022 is 46.4 million. If you exclude the parking enforcement division and the TNC tax revenue from SDOT's budget, the remaining general fund contribution would be 49.5 million, which is still higher than the minimum requirement. I'd also point out that these resources, uh, while they do match the expenditures, they include a significant drawdown of fund balance. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows some of SDOT's major funds, and uh, it highlights that uh, the department is relying on almost 41 million of fund balance in 2022. Some of this is expected, uh, particularly for Move Seattle, where this is consistent with planned spending on the portfolio of projects. Um, that levy expires in 2024, and it is tied to a capital uh, spending plan. But the other uh, funds really do provide funding for SDOT's ongoing operations and maintenance. Even with the use of fund balance, uh, SDOT's ba budget relies on significant recovery of transportation revenue sources, though not back to pre-pandemic levels. And so there is a risk that if resources don't recover as quickly as projected, uh, we would have to use uh, additional draw on fund balance or potentially cut back on uh, levels of service. With the current financial pro projections, the transportation fund would not become net positive in revenue until 2024. So that sort of concludes my broad overview and the next slides will cover issues for council's attention. So I'm happy to take any questions before we move into that. Seeing none. So Peterson, uh, would you like to offer any questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, my comments will be similar to the ones I offered when um, SDOT presented to us, uh, which is that we're very appreciative of the, the leadership at SDOT. Uh, Sam Zimbabwe has, has done a fantastic job, especially with um, so many um, different uh, priorities to try to um, juggle and synthesize with West Seattle Bridge closure, uh, dealing with that emergency. I really appreciate um, all the the city workers in the field uh, working on these projects for us. There are a lot of Vision Zero safety projects that are being implemented now. And I know there's, there'll be an interest in a lot of um, looking at a, a district specific projects like pedestrian safety projects that we have in our districts. And um, bigger picture, um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned before, one disappointment with this budget is that it doesn't, it seems to kick the can down the road again on on bridges and we have um, consistently discussed this issue, you know, for, for the past year. And now that we have the full $700 million budget in front of us, I'm, I'm, my questions later as we get into issue ID will, will be about how can we make this a, a yes end moment where we are um, honoring the, the previous discussions and decisions on how to allocate the um, the seven million dollars of vehicle licensee that that's a discussion that is um, in the past in a way because now we have the full seven hundred million dollar budget and we also have an infrastructure bill that that uh, or two infrastructure bills we hope that are coming from the Congress and I think this is the a moment that 
with the West Seattle Bridge closure, with the bridge audit, um, that we that we as a council, while the, while the, the executive has not done much more for bridges here, this is an opportunity for us to do more for bridges, multimodal bridges, uh, buses use bridges, pedestrians use bridges. I'm thinking about the university bridge. Uh, also thinking about some of the commitments made during the move to move Seattle levy voters. Um, if you remember, the Seattle Times did an excellent piece on how uh, there were re-estimates of the seismic upgrade costs to, to bridges throughout the city and that there were 16 bridges that were promised for seismic upgrades and, and SDOT, um, when they got revised estimates, they actually took some bridges off the list. And so I would like to look at um, addressing those bridge issues that includes the Ballard Bridge, the, the Fremont Bridge, the University Bridge, um, the Second Avenue South Bridge, which was ranked poor by the bridge audit. And so, so I'll be, uh, as we get an issue ID, I wanna sort of take an expansive view of the $700 million budget. And, and also looking at the transit investments, um, we, as, as you know, we added $20 uh, VLF, which added $7 million. Um, so that, that funding, um, what we'll learn later, I think in this, and it's, it's, in, the, it's in Calvin's excellent memo, um, is that there are some reserve, S, SDOT is holding back a lot of money for transit. And I know that there's a desire to do more for transit. I, I do wanna just daylight the um the reserves that are just sitting there about 17 million i believe so we'll talk more about that as we go through issue id but um chair Mosqueda, thank you those are my initial thoughts and comments appreciate that thank you and having recently tried to bring a bike trailer for a kiddo on one of these bridges and having to take the road because it would not fit i completely appreciate the uh, connections that you have drawn between bridges and multimodal transit options, including buses. So look forward to getting into issue ID. I'm not seeing any additional comments. Let's go ahead. Next slide, please, Patty. So the first issue for discussion is the vehicle license fee. Um, in last year's budget, council authorized an increase in the vehicle license fee from $20 to $40. And at that time, council directed SDOT to engage in a stakeholder process to develop a spending plan for the additional revenue. After SDOT completed that process, council approved a 2021 spending plan, which funded SDOT's operational programs for safe streets, safe sidewalks, strong bridges and structures, active transportation management, uh, maintenance, and planning. In approving the 2021 spending, council also directed SDOT to develop a list of transportation projects that could be funded by 100 million of bond financing. So this was the idea of turning that revenue stream into a um, uh, into debt service to finance a large uh, uh, bond outlay. The project list was to include a minimum of 75 million for bridge projects. And that list is actually on the next couple slides. So we can go to that in a second. The 2022 proposed budget does not include any funding for the projects on this list, but proposes, proposes to continue spending on the same operational programs as of 2021. So uh, I have listed here an option to redirect those resources to other priorities. Next slide, please, Patty. So the next couple slides do show the SDOT project list. And I just wanted to note that um, issue two and issue three, um, I provide a, a summary of SDOT's bridge and vision zero spending to help provide some additional context to this, to this conversation. So for this first slide shows the 75 million of proposed or not proposed, but of identified uh, bridge projects. Uh, there are eight bridge projects here in total, and the spending is spread out over the next five years, which if uh, pursued would provide time for SDOT to move through project development and finish design. These amounts are total estimated project costs. And in developing these, this project list, SDOT did not rely on any external grant funding. I think I see a question. Is there a clarifying question, Council Member Herbal? Oh, Council Member, you are still on mute. Are we lit limiting ourselves to clarifying questions at this point? Well, um, I think that if your hand or comment was more related to weighing in on the options, then I'm, I might wait for us to get through the full slide here. Um, yeah, I think it's more, my, my comment is more granular than, than the options. It's more to do with 
the projects on the list. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. I just want to note that um, the first two projects are, of course, um, District 1 projects. Um, and item A is the Fauntleroy Freeway, which connects the bridge to the peninsula. Item B is the, uh, the Spokane Viaduct, which connects the bridge to the rest um, of the road heading east towards I-5. For um, And these are for projects, proposed for projects for 2022 and 2023 and 2024. Um, under the impression uh, from the questions that we um, submitted to SDOT that these projects would require road and lane closures. Um, and I just want to say for the record, if we are, um, if the option that is uh, moves forward related to um, pursuing bond financing for bridges, I would like to take a look at this list because I really feel that um, West Seattle needs a break, <laughs> and I, 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 I think I'd like to make sure that we keep the roadway open and free from closures as much as possible for the next few years. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. And I think, um, you know, the, the the policy option before you is really, uh, do you want to continue using this funding for operational funding, or do you want to divert it to a capital program of some sort, and then we can work through the details of what that capital program might look like? And this is um, this is one option that uh, identified projects that were that that SDOT is aware of, and we can work to move things around if if that is the direction the council goes. Patty, can Chair, you Chair, may I? Um, Please go ahead. And and I just I know that you know this is how it was sort of framed back in the spring because we had created this additional funding of seven million dollars, and there was a. a as we like to say, a robust debate about you know, how to how to invest those dollars, and and I just even though that's how it was framed up before, because we had that new money and there was, but it was a relatively small amount of money. Um, now we have the full seven hundred million dollar budget, so I, I don't think it's an either or choice. Uh, it could be a yes and depending on how we 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 unpack the entire budget. But I, I appreciate. Um, seeing these numbers on the screen here for potential projects and you know i'm 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 disappointed that the durkin administration didn't then choose to fund them uh, or or provide a way to fund them we know there are ways to fund them such as with by issuing bonds but we want to be careful how we then pay for those bonds so we're not taking away from other programs and i, I think there there may be a way to do that as we continue our budget discussions thank you patty next slide please um, this slide shows the $25 million of non-bridge projects. Uh, SDOT identified uh, nine projects, and similarly, these projects are spread out over the next three years. Uh, they're generally smaller projects. Uh, they're not as complicated as the bridge projects. And um, as part of the response to the request, they only identified um, projects that were eligible for bond financing. So they only included projects with, with an expected life of over 20 years. I think I mentioned previously that uh, the next couple items will cover sort of what is in the bridge spending and vision zero spending, but uh, if there are any other questions, I, I can move on. I'm not seeing any hands, Calvin. Next slide, please, Patty. So um, the next issue for discussion is the bridge infrastructure spending. In 2020, at Chairman Peterson, Council Member Chair Peterson's request, the City Auditor completed a report on SDOT's bridge maintenance program. And that audit made 10 recommendations for business process improvements, which SDOT is currently implementing. The report also identified an ongoing need for 34 million per year for bridge maintenance, which is based on an engineering assumption that annual maintenance should be 1% of the total replacement cost of the asset. The report found that SDOT's average spending on bridge maintenance from 2006 to 2019 was 6.6 .6 million per year. In calculating this figure, the audit focused only on routine maintenance programs, and the audit excluded asset preservation programs such as seismic upgrades and bridge replacement expenses. To provide a bit more context, the next slide summarizes SDOT's total proposed capital and operating programs related to bridges. Next slide, please. So this table Sorry, only shows- uh, let's do one issue at a time, if we can. Um, 
uh, if we go back one slide real quick, do you mind just backing up one more so that we can have uh, kind of concluding thoughts on that first issue ID? Councilmember Peterson, did you have your hand up? Oh, you're still on mute, Councilmember, sorry. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. It was actually on the next slide, slide A, the one about the bridge maintenance piece from the audit. I just wanted to um, provide additional cut yeah, for that slide. 34 million was on the low end. The auditor, I believe, had a range saying, you know, on the low end, 34 million annually up to 102 million annually um, with a one to 3% of total asset value uh, for the bridges. So I just wanted to, and and some, some folks would, you know, take the midpoint of the 34 million and the 102 million and just say it's 68 million is what the ongoing repair and maintenance costs would ideally or the investments would ideally be if 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 we had those resources thank you thank you calvin i'm sorry to interrupt you i just wanted to make sure that um we're following along here with the issue identification that you've um, included in your memo. So if folks had any additional comments before we move on to the bridge infrastructure piece, were there any additional comments or questions that people had on issue ID number one and the options A and B there? Okay, great. Thanks, Calvin. Sorry about that. Um, and please continue. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate uh, appreciate you holding me <laughs> to, no, this, to the agenda. No, you were doing great. I know there's a lot of context here, so thanks for walking us through it all. Patty, could you please um, turn to the next slide? Thank you. So this table shows uh, only programmatic spending on bridges in the proposed budget. Um, this is prog programmatic bridge spending. So the West Seattle Bridge, for example, is not included. Um, you can see that the bulk of the capital spending is closely tied to the Move Seattle Levy timeline, which expires in 2024. The bridge seismic program, for example, which is one that Councilmember Peterson uh, mentioned earlier, um, funds uh, currently nine bridges as a deliverable of the Move Seattle Levy with this particular line item. Uh, at the bottom half of the table, we only show um, the operational spending for 2022, but these programs are expected to be ongoing and funded in future budgets. These cover operations and maintenance for all of the bridge and structures division. So this includes some other functions that aren't necessarily tied to bridges, such as engineering support for other projects. In the 2022 proposed budget, um, there is a proposal to add 5.2 million for bridge capital spending to fund repairs for the fourth over Argo bridge and repairs on three of SDOT's bascule bridges. The proposed budget also includes 1.9 million from the VLF money that we discussed earlier for bridge maintenance, which largely replaced what was a one-time $2 million general fund ad that council added in the 2021 adopted budget. Are there any questions on on this issue. Sure. Please go ahead, Council Member Peterson. Just to clarify, uh, Calvin, you might have mentioned this, but item D, bridge seismic, um, that does not include the move Seattle levy items for Ballard Bridge and Fremont Bridge, correct? Because those are taken off the. That's correct. It's the ones that were um, approved by the the reassessment from 2020 or 2019, I can't remember exactly when the the, the realignment happened. Uh, there were two phases of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, with no other questions, I go to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. So issue three, again, to provide some, some additional uh, context is vision zero spending. Uh, Vision Zero is the city's goal of eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries on city streets by 2030. And so it is a safety goal for both SDOT and the traveling public. And because Vision Zero is an overarching vision, it can be sometimes difficult to point out all the related capital spending in the CIP. Um, many individual projects like the Georgetown to South Park Trail are fundamentally Vision Zero projects. But the CIP does include several programmatic capital programs that are dedicated to implementing Vision Zero improvements. And so um, on the next slide, I've, I've provided a summary of this proposed spending uh, for these CIP projects. Um, once again, this table only shows um, secured funding in the CIP and the spending reflects reliance on the Move Seattle levy, um, similar to the, to the bridge uh, uh, projects. There's only one project that is actually named for Vision Zero, and it focuses on the high traffic arterials that have the highest number of crashes. 
uh, that is in row A. Um, the uh, line item in row B, the Neighborhood Traffic Control Program, focuses for traffic calming on non-arterial streets. Um, there are two participatory budgeting programs, the items C and item D, Neighborhood Large Projects and the Neighborhood Park Street Fund, uh, which generally fund projects that are selected by the community. Um, those projects are not currently accepting new requests, but they are funding projects that were already identified and are in the queue uh, for delivery. And then the remaining projects that are listed fund implementation of the pedestrian master plan and the bike master plan. Um, so I, I, I wanted to note um, for both the Vision Zero programs and the bridge uh, programs, and actually for SDOT in general, that um, with Move Seattle expiring in 2024, thinking through what a renewal of that might might what a proposal might look like is really the next major opportunity to contemplate major shifts in the spending priorities uh we we have commitments from move seattle we have leveraged a lot of uh, uh transportation revenues and um we are coming up on a time where we can dramatically rethink or or reprioritize uh the spending for uh, another window if we go forward with a um, with a proposed renewal and uh, I'll stop here if there are any questions on this slide. Thank you, council members, any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any, Calvin. Okay, Patty, next slide, please. Issue number four is federal infrastructure funding. And so of great interest to all of us is the federal infrastructure bill, which passed the Senate in August. Uh, that bill has $1.2 trillion for transportation, utility, and internet investments, and this included the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act. Um, the funding proposal uh, covers five years, 2022 through 2026, uh, but it still requires passage in the House before becoming law. Most of the transportation funding would flow through existing federal grant programs and formula allocations, so um, we'll need to monitor those program requirements as the federal agencies roll them out. Uh, SDOT has recent experience in securing federal funds, most notably, uh, most recently for the Madison BRT and the West Seattle Bridge. But uh, some of the potential projects that, that we may want to put forth may need additional project development and design to be eligible and competitive for these grants. Councilman Peterson. And I, my office did, I, I did speak with the staff at, um, the DC office and committee staff of um, our, one of our US senators, Maria Cantwell, to try to get a, a better understanding of the $1.2 trillion, the bipartisan, the so called bipartisan infrastructure bill. And the good news is that they, that includes a small bridge competitive grant program. And they did confirm that the city having local dollars to match would put us in a highly competitive position unlike other we compared to other cities we have a lot of bridges and we have a lot of smaller bridges and so um that is another uh I'll keep trying to pitch the concept of doing something more for bridges here uh, there's a real opportunity here with this with this um federal bill to put together some local matching dollars it's true that sdot has had uh, recent success in, in getting things funded. Um, uh, part of that, I believe, is, is due to the West Seattle Bridge uh, emergency that we had. Everybody, I think, recognized that was an emergency, and so we were able to get matching funds for that. Um, but uh, I wanted to just uh, note that the one of the authors of this, this uh, bill is saying that, that having a local funding match would put us in a more competitive position for a small bridge, local small bridge program. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. And um, uh, I, yeah, I, I wanna echo your appreciation for our congressional delegation, Senator Murray, Senator Cantwell, um, and our Seattle delegation who have been working on that. I also um, want to echo there strong support for a continuation of congressional direction and discretion so that they can identify projects like this and to be able to maintain that at the federal level is something that they have been fighting for. So appreciate their work on that. Um, and uh, wanna also 
emphasize the importance of passing the infrastructure bill, traditional infrastructure um, for bridges and roads, along with human infrastructure with the Build Back Better Act. And I think that um, that is uh, a conversation our congressional members are having right now and appreciate Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell and Senator uh, Representative Jayapal's leadership on that. So hopefully we will be able to enact infrastructure for roads, bridges, and families across our city here soon. Thank you for raising this, um, Cal, and we will continue to look for updates on how that moves and if there's anything from your conversations with uh, uh, senators as well, Councilmember Peterson, that we should be doing to show our support broadly for the infrastructure bills. I'm happy to work with you as well to send, send those, those messages. Did you still have your hand up, Councilmember Peterson, on another end? Okay, just carry over. Okay, great. Council President Gonzalez, anything from you? I was just going to suggest, and 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 Calvin, I don't know, maybe maybe you've already done that, but ha, have you had any um, coordination with folks over at the Office of Intergovernmental Relations on this issue? And perhaps you can share a little bit more about what um, conversations you've had with OIR that might be relevant to this discussion. Um, I, I have had conversations with OIR mostly to confirm what I've prepared in the memo and, and mentioned uh, here. I think it's a it's a fluid. Um, uh, we are all waiting to see what actually comes out and actually gets gets approved into law. Um, I think there there may be options for uh, a congressional delegation to to identify specific uh, needs that that may come into play. But I think the vast majority of the money will still rely on existing programs, which which we do have some history um, uh, uh, securing funding from. Uh, typically, those do require local match of of some short some amount to to demonstrate that you have a real project. And um, uh, I think one of the the key things that that um, uh, maybe will come up again later on in my in my paper uh, getting sort of projects developed enough where we are confident of the cost uh, uh, confident of the scope uh, that helps with our our um, project requests our grant requests as well because we're we're, we're clear that we have a, a a clearly defined project and it isn't uh, uh, firm cost estimates and and uh, a plan for how to move forward so I I do think that um, Part of this is is trying to figure out when the right time to, when will the um, the granting agencies make this money available? Uh, the the budget is proposed to be available over five fiscal years. Uh, some of the money does tend to roll over. It's you get into the into the queue and then uh, you, you kind of get to the place where you actually get the award many years later. So. Um, I think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done up front to kind of get a project list developed that that could be eligible for funding. Okay. okay, I think I will. Um, Patty, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, very briefly, did Council um, Council President anything else on that? Okay, great, great question. Thank you, Cal, for the work that you've done on coordinating with our Office of Intergovernmental Relations, and um, we look forward to you know standing at the ready to help in any way, and again sending our appreciation to the Seattle delegation and our. Washington uh, congressional representatives um, for all that they are trying to do in the Senate and in our House to make sure that these bills are all passed together and that we get the infrastructure funding. Thank you. Thank you. Issue five is the STBD Proposition One transit service. So just as a reminder for everyone, Seattle voters renewed Proposition One in 2020 and it authorized a 0.15% sales tax to fund transit service and transit related programs. So the proposed budget increases the amount of transit service purchased from 2020 <clears throat> from King County Metro by about 7.7 .7 million a total of 28.5 million of transit service, which is roughly equivalent to 150,000 bus service hours or about 2,200 weekly bus trips. I note that transit ridership has not yet recovered from the effects of the pandemic. Um, the WashDOT uh, reporting site shows sort of a statewide number that's about 40% below baseline through the summer. Uh, it is increasing, it is recovering, but we're, we're still not uh, at pre-pandemic levels um, yet. Uh, fair revenue does help offset the cost of transit service, so lower ridership means that uh, our transit service purchases cost more per, per hour. 
SDOT is holding about 17 million in reserves against potential escalating costs or revenue fluctuations if, if our revenue projections don't uh, hold. And the, res the reserves are also um, there to, to manage the program over the entirety of the, of the measure. Um, our transit service agreement with Metro allows us to, um, we're required, uh, the maximum service change we can do is uh, 100,000 hours. So if, uh, if the measure were to expire, there is a need to keep some uh, funding available to be able to uh, meter that out over the, the Metro service um, uh, planning changes to uh, meet the commitments in the contract. The proposed budget also funds programs that support access to transit for low-income individuals, essential workers, and students, uh, transit infrastructure projects, and programs to meet emerging needs related to COVID-19 and the closure of the West Seattle Bridge. I'll pause here if there are any questions. Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Chair Muscat. Th thank you, Calvin, for the mentioning of the reserves that that SDOT is proposing that we hold back, um, and your memo is is very thorough on this too. And on page eleven, um, the seventeen million dollars and part of that was a holdover from the previous measure. And I I just one of the reasons that SDOT gave, which I think you mentioned, was the the to allow for a gradual ramp down of transit services if the measure is not re renewed in twenty twenty seven and I just feel that if we do want to ramp up uh, these transit, invest these transit dollars sooner, that I would think there would be room to do that uh, without um, jeopardizing the future. Because I know that there was a lot of discussion about take looking at this um, transportation benefit district and taking it, um, you know, doing something um, King County wide, so that we go back to a regional approach and we had structured this um, ballot measure to be um, several years into the future so that we could um, we could go to the voters perhaps early to King County see if we could do it regionally and then if not we can we have the fallback position of doing it in Seattle where there's such strong support for transit here so to me the renewal risk is very minimal and yet right now we have a desire a lot of advocates are writing us do more for transit let's expand transit in terms of the frequency and the reach of of our bus system we've got the light rail stations opening up and i know I've, we've gotten emails in from our office uh folks who'd like to see more frequency getting them to the light rail stations and so i i one of the things we may want to do during this budget process is take a hard look at those reserves, how much are really needed, and and wouldn't it be nice to deploy more of those those transit dollars now? The one um, thought that I, I would um, put to to you is uh, to just remember that uh, increasing transit service now is uh, you know the expectation is that we would want to keep those services into the future as well. So. Um, you know, th thinking about adding, using the reserves for a one-time drawdown now, sort of, uh, please think about that in terms of what that increased cost is for the next several years of, of that service, because we would, you know, we wouldn't want to just ramp up a service in one year and then have to take it take it back as if revenues aren't matched. So to kind of think through um, the overtime impact of adding service. But as I recall, um, you had a nice chart. This might have been a part of the question and answer process with when you were asking the agency to provide a, the spend plan, not just for 2022, but for the entire length of, of STBD. And they were piling money into the reserves throughout you know, every year. And so um, it seems like there could be a, a, a way of adding transit service from the reserves in a in a way that is sustainable through the rest of, um, because because this this issue of ramp down risk in the final year I think is is less uh, of an issue because we'll either we'll either win it King County wide or we're going to win it in Seattle and so I don't I just you know I would hate to hold back on service now when there's such demand and having that uh, intense frequency of, of buses. Um, is is what will get people um, to consider 
getting out of their cars and, and the reliability of the buses. So just just some thoughts there. Thanks. Yes, Councilman Private. I was. It was just a sustainability issue that I wanted to make sure was part of the conversation. Thank you. Okay, Kelvin. I am not seeing additional hands on this one. Okay, oh, Patty. Excuse next. me, Council President. Uh, please go ahead. I just thank you, um, Madam Chair. Sorry for raising my hand so late here. I I, I did um, you know in response to your your flag, um, Calvin, which is always a, always a good one. Um, we don't want to inadvertently create uh, fiscal cliffs where they where they um, don't need to be, which I think is what you're flagging here. Is there um, is there sort of an in between between um, you know status quo and what Councilmember Peterson is proposing? Uh, in other words, is there a way to make an increase in transit service uh, in 2022 that is that is more scalable? Um, so I'm thinking, for example, in the, our conversation around the vehicle licensing fee, where we looked at <clears throat> how we can target some of those um, dollars towards um, essential workers, for example, and and providing them with reduced fares or free fares. So I'm just sort of thinking about whether there is something similar um, to, to, to that kind of a model that would allow us to um, have an increase in transit service in 2022 that that is scalable in nature so as to avoid the fiscal cliff danger that you are um, identifying. I think um, I think it will take some more uh, work with the department to to dig into the re the reserves, the plan reserves, and and sort of work out what what some options might be and, and what that might look like. Um, it really does come down to the funding. We have a, a a revenue stream, expected revenue stream that's tied to sales tax, and uh, you know, I, I think it it I don't know that there's there's that much else that we can do um, aside from think through what the revenue policy should be unless we're willing to consider other revenue sources to, su uh, to support transit service. Got it. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more questions. Uh, Patty, next slide, please. So Issue number six is the Center City Streetcar and the existing sales streetcar system. Um, these really are kind of two separate issues, but I think they do sort of inform each other. Uh, the 2022 proposed budget includes 2.4 million to restart project development on the Center City Streetcar connector. So as a reminder, this project would connect the existing South Lake Union Streetcar to the First Hill Streetcar through downtown Seattle. Prior to the pandemic, Council had authorized $9 million to assess the project after cost estimates increased and problems with the vehicle design were reported. But with the pandemic, Council redirected those funds to other priorities, and so this project was put on hiatus. The proposed $2.4 million would allow SDOT to reassess how to proceed with the project, including maintaining eligibility for federal grants and evaluating potential conflicts with the Sound Transit downtown tunnel alignment for the West Seattle uh, Ballard extension. The proposed funding is general fund using the TNC tax revenue. So as an option, council may not want to restart the NRC streetcar project and then could then re, um, repurpose that funding. Um, the proposed budget also includes 5.3 million to operate the existing First Hill and uh, South Lake Union streetcars. And this is the SDOT contribution to the total cost of operations, which will be about 14 million in 2022. Uh, the streetcar does rely on fares and contributions from Sound Transit and King County to fund operations. Uh, these external contributions will expire over the next few years, and so SDOT's contributions are projected to increase over time to make up the difference. Uh, as with other forms of transit, ridership on the streetcar is recovering, but the ultimate pace of that recovery is still unknown. The proposed budget assumes that the streetcar will raise $1.6 million of fare revenue in 2022, which is um, pretty close to the 1.8 million that was collected before the pandemic in 2019. So if ridership uh, recovers slower than anticipated, streetcar service may require additional public subsidy or reductions in planned service. And I'll pause for any questions. Council members, any questions? Okay, Council Member Peterson, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. 
I was, uh, in terms of the $2.4 million, um, I was just looking at the capital improvement program part of our budget. Um, and there's, you know, the Central City Connector has its own page in the, in the budget. And if, um, if, if there is an, if, if there were a study and there was the option to go forward, it would be, um, I mean, there's a lot of sunk costs already into this project and then i believe it'd be about 165 million or something more that would have to be spent and that's for the capital element not not the operating subsidy and so i'm just you know i just i think i've been consistent with my concerns about this particular project uh, being redundant with other uh, modes of, of transportation along that uh, corridor there with the light rail and buses and um, other options that are available. I, as I recall, this is not a, this is not a move Seattle levy project. We have lots of unfulfilled promises with move Seattle levy, the seismic bridge upgrades I mentioned, for example, um, I am concerned this project, is, um, um, well, I'll just, I'll just stop there because I see Councilor Herbal. Sure. Councilman Peterson. Councilman Herbal. Um, I just want to add um, for clarification purposes um, the CIP entry for this project lists 92 million in unsecured funding. It says unsecured funding strategy. SDOT will continue to work with the mayor's office and the city council to determine the future of the project. Separately, the CIP entry notes 50 million and federal funding from 2023 as secured. Um, I um, had put in a question um, to SDOT about the fe federal funding and the budget office reply um, acknowledges that the small starts grant was never awarded. SDOT holds no grant funds associated with this grant. The $50 million lapsed at the end of fiscal year, September 30th, 2021. So, um, there is not 50 million in federal funding secured. Um, and I, I know that um, Director Zimbabwe feels feels confident in um, his um, uh, F planned efforts to, to secure federal funding, but I, I just think it's really important to know um, where the match from the federal government stands at this point, because that has really been um, a, a driver of um, some of our decisions in the past is is the the fact that we were um, uh, we didn't have the money in hand, but the 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 funds had been been approved. So uh, I think it's really important to, to consider that when we're considering um, investing more dollars in studying this um, option. I agree with Councilmember Peterson that that corridor is well served by transit. And um, the funding source, uh, TNC taxes, would be a great um, a great uh, funding source for um, investing more deeply in um, some of our Region Zero projects. So I, I would be really interested in um, in looking at other more pressing needs uh, for those TNC funds. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Herbold. I do. I did have a similar question about that, and then I see Kelvin um, off mute and Council, Council President Gonzalez up next. So, Kelvin, uh, comments on where the city is actively seeking new funds from uh, federal opportunities for this, and then maybe just piling on to what Council Member um, Herbold just noted. Does that mean that the total amount of lapsed funding from the federal government on this is actually $57.3 million that we have not been able to utilize that has been allocated to the city from our federal partners? I, I know there is no outstanding federal grant money uh, as, as council member uh, Herbold mentioned, it, it has lapsed. Um, SDOT had funding, uh, had, had received a grant to pursue vehicle procurement and that was um, funding, that was part of what uh, led to um, uh, some of the reevaluating of the project two years ago, uh, that that grant has has lapsed. We did not spend it, um, and so currently there are no outstanding grants on the project. Uh, the project is still in the um, 
it, it maintains its eligibility for future small grants programs. So it, it is still being reported to FTA and has an active grant uh, application in, uh, but there is there are no current awards. Okay, there's no current awards. And then just to follow up with Councilmember Herbal's question, is there active seeking of additional federal dollars happening right now that we know of? Um, I think beyond just sort of maintaining the eligibility in the small starts program, I think that's that's the only effort I'm aware of um, to the extent that the new uh, infrastructure bill, if it passes and provides more money to that program, then then presumably there would be more federal money available through that existing program. But I'm not aware of any other um, any other uh, uh, grant search activity. OK, thanks. Council President, please go ahead. Um, thanks. I, <clears throat> I would also be interested in in hearing a little bit uh, more about um, uh, you know understanding that we don't have any information now that SDOT is um, actively <clears throat> pursuing particular grants. Um, I think it would be helpful to get an understanding of their perspective of opportunity in that area for um, for grants um, to continue to advance the. Um, the vision related to the Center City Streetcar Connector, um, and and so I, I, I um, hope Kelvin that you're able to after today's uh, meeting go and talk to SDOT about sort of what 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 they're thinking might be available, um, <clears throat> so that we have a, a, a better sense and context for what the realm of possibility might be to. Um, address uh, that gap in this existing uh, project. I, I do want to just address really quickly a couple of comments made by my um, my, my good colleagues, Councilmember Peterson and Herbold, as it relates to redundancy or areas that are already well served by transit. And I, I just want to remind us that you know literature in the area of transportation. I mean, dating back to the early '80s repeatedly tells us that redundancy should be a feature of all transit systems, especially in mid to large sized cities, because that's what makes the transit network and system actually function really well. So um, so so I I want to I want to make sure that we are focused on those good practices and on the the, um, you know, expert um, literature that really does talk about how critically important it is for our transit sim systems to have redundancy, because if one one part of the system uh, goes out during an emergency or for whatever other reason, um, that creates a real um, pressure on uh, people being able to access transit service if that transit service is no longer available. Um, and creating these other redundancies allows people to have um, options uh, throughout the day. And of course, options, if one part of that transit structure fails, then they, they can rely on the other redundant part that is still functioning and still moving forward. So um, I, I normally, I agree that redundancy isn't always the most efficient and good thing, but as it relates to transit, um, you know, study after study, literature piece after literature piece tells us that redundancy is a feature, not a bug in transit systems and wanted to uh, lift that up for conversations today. As we, as we continue, that. as we continue to debate sort of how to invest these really critical um, uh, limited resources to enhance our transit network and system. I appreciate that council president. Thank you for that reminder and council member Peterson, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. And um, a couple of points on this. Um, I right now there are there is the light rail and and the bus uh, as transit options. So I think that there is some redundancy, some positive redundancy there now. So I, I agree with Council President Gonzalez on that, that that is helpful to have that. And 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 um, I'm just didn't I'm just concerned about the additional cost. With the other needs we have, and adding a, adding a third third um, item uh, at that at such high cost, um, and um, Calvin, to the extent that you do check in with SDOT about what they think their chances are for for federal funding for this going forward, since it's not it's not secured at this point, um, asking 
what the status is of the, I, I understand the Office of Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Transportation is still, that this project is still under active investigation by the OIG at U.S. DOT. And so I don't know how that plays into our ability to get federal funding if they're under federal investigation for the, the project. So um, that would just be something to throw into the mix to see if it would be eligible at this at this time for funding. I'll definitely follow up with uh, Astad and CBO on sort of the current thinking about federal funding. I, I do think part of their intention in proposing this 2.4 million was to rethink the funding strategy in general. Um, the project really has not had any significant work on uh, the city side for a couple of years now. So um, I, I think it, it is, um, I'm not sure how, how good their response is going how much of a improved response they're going to be able to give us uh, right now. Uh, okay, thank you, Calvin. Council President, please go ahead. Sorry, just really quickly. Um, I, I think, you know, <clears throat> I think if the policy choice related to the center city streetcar is being fueled by concerns related to, to whether or not we can, um, you know, effectively get those federal grants, that's one policy choice that I think uh, you know, the, the information we're hoping to understand a little bit better from SDOT will be helpful towards understanding. And Calvin, it might be that they say we don't have any good prospects. Um, but I, I feel like I haven't heard that very clearly and stated, you know, that unequivocally. And if that's the case, then that's relevant information for us as we, as we, as we continue to identify, um, you know, ways to, to move through um, the, the, you know, frankly, the pickle that we're in as it relates to the center city streetcar connector project. And so it would just be helpful to me to just sort of hear <laughs> um, one way or the other is, you know, like, is, is this, is, is, did we sort of miss our opportunity here? And now we're in a position where, um, where we are once again, um, delivering on a set of broken promises um, it, to members of the community who expected that we would have a, a connected system of streetcars um, from this from the center city all the way to um, to Chinatown International District. And so we just we just got to sort of identify whether or not that's going to be another pro broken promise or whether we are going to um, come together with a with a clear plan on how we are going to secure the fifty million dollar gap that has been identified through um, through your work and the department's work. And then the last thing I just want to say is again that's one set of questions. The other set of questions is is sort of the vision around what kind of transit network we want to create. And I I get really concerned when when we we um, you know cite to existing bus and future light rail or existing light rail is sort of the only um, amount of redundancy that we should have and I, and I want to I want to make sure that we are making decisions about what we want our multimodal transit network to be by including things like streetcars or um, bike lanes or you know good safe sidewalks these are all important redundancies for us to have and um, while I agree that this area generally has access to uh, good transit services, um, again, I, 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 don't, I don't think that we have sort of um, reached redundancy saturation as has been um, asserted in our conversation today. So, um, so those are, those are I, I, see that, I see there's a distinction between can we fund these projects and the, the sort of policy question around what kind of transit network are we looking to create for this part of the city that will um, serve workers visitors and um, and others in this in this area who are who are taking public transit which is good for all of us because it reduces congestion in downtown thank you council president um i will uh, just underscore one question that I asked earlier because it relates to what the council president just lifted up again and then we'll have council member Herbold close us off on this one and then we'll get to the last uh, item 
the last three items for issue identification here. Um, Calvin, to that point that Council President Gonzalez just made, again, I want to make sure that the expiration of the $7.3 million for the Small Starts grant, if that has expired and we have also let the $50 million that we originally received expire, have we lost or are we in a worse position to get federal grants in the future? Politically, I would guess yes, because when people continue to put time and energy and political capital into helping the city receive federal funding and then to have it not be put to use, I assume, like our state legislative members, um, it's harder for them to continue to find funding for um, specific projects. But, um, like, uh, you know, technically, are we still eligible for all of these other grants? And is the loss of 50 million and the unused and expired 7.3 million called out in your memo here, um, are we still able to secure federal grants for this project in the future? So that's just a quick underscoring of, of the big questions there. Um, and if you don't have the answer now, that's fine too. Well, I have um, a couple thoughts that I, I just wanted to add. So, I, I mean, SDOT has been very clear that, that they think the project on its merits, on the amount of uh, ridership that it would generate and sort of the uh, efficiency argument of connecting the existing streetcar lines, they think that the project does score very well um, for the small starts criteria. And I have no reason to argue that. I think that compared to other uh, public um, transit projects that are proposed around the country, um, that we probably do score very well in terms of the the land uses where it would support and the ridership it would generate. But that you know, transit projects. Um, one of the interesting things about the streetcar is that uh, we have a legacy of of these the the South Lake Union streetcar, which was mostly an economic development tool uh, for South Lake Union, and the First Hill streetcar, which was a um, uh, uh, it was a way to connect First Hill to the transit network after the First Hill Sound Transit Station was um, eliminated uh, from the system. Uh, so you know, we had these 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 two sort of legacy projects that that didn't really, I, I don't think, fully um, um, internalized the ongoing costs that that transit transit subsidy is required to run transit. Uh, and that's what we're seeing now in terms of the amount of, of commercial parks, uh, commercial parking tax revenue that we are um, providing to operating the systems. So I think these things kind of uh, the, the system I think is a is a is a good um, uh, uh, scores well in terms of uh, comparable FTA uh, uh, grants that are that are out there. Uh, I think it's as much a question of whether we have the we, do we have a financial plan that makes sense to us to to support that or not? I think that's that's really kind of the rub here. Um, I you know politically, I think if we have uh, not taken action on the small stars grant, that maybe doesn't is not a great message for um, other funding sources or for uh, some of our our uh, uh, delegation partners. But in terms of the the small stars grants itself, I, I think we're still in the queue, and it's more of a delay and not necessarily that we've foregone the opportunity. Great, and just want to double check before we move on to Council Member Herbold, Council Member Council President, did you have a follow up? I see your hand still up. No. No, I just forgot to lower my hand. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Herbal, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just want to um, go back to why um, why we're talking about this $50 million, why, why I'm talking about this $50 million, um, because I heard, I heard reference to a $50 million gap. Um, it's not a $50 million gap. There's a $140 million gap. The, for me, the importance of the fifty million dollars in federal funding in this in this discussion has always been for many many years is that we should continue to pursue this project and fill the gap between the full the full cost of the pro project because we have this fifty million dollars, um, and so in my questioning whether or not we have this fifty million dollars is to suggest the narrative that has been used for years that we have federal that we have secured federal funding and so we should look at filling 
the rest of the gap because we have such a such a substantial match. I'm questioning that now. It is not to suggest that we only have a fifty million dollar gap, though. We have a we have a one hundred and forty million dollar gap. And that's just that's just if n- none of the costs have have gone up since the last time we had this conversation two years ago. <laughs> Okay. I was holding back on making a joke about redundancy saturation, <laughs> given the three-year conversation. Uh, too funny. Okay, please go ahead, Calvin. Okay. Next slide, please. So issue number seven is the integrated transportation planning proposal. Um, SDOT is proposing to do a major overhaul of its transportation planning, which would integrate the existing modal plans into one common transportation framework and one document. Um, They propose to do public outreach uh, uh, concurrent with OPCD's major comprehensive plan update and sort of roll those efforts out together. Uh, The total cost of the total of the transportation plan update is expected to be about 4.5 to $5 million over the next uh, two, three years. The proposed budget adds uh, about $3 million for this effort in 2022, and they have about 500,000 of existing planning resources available. This type of work would um, also help inform a new levy proposal potentially for renewing Move Seattle. And uh, as I mentioned before, levy renewal planning uh, would be a a great opportunity to reassess all of our transportation revenues and transportation priority spending. Any questions? Any questions on that? Not seeing any questions. Let me ask okay. one quick question here then. Just pause to see if any hands go up. Okay. Um, of the three million available for integrated transportation planning, can you tell me what the total community outreach and engagement budget is? And similar to our other conversations around OPCD and the need for authentic community engagement, um, is there any way to gauge whether or not this is sufficient for the type of community outreach that's needed? I, I heard the conversation yesterday, uh, so I'll, I'll follow up with the um... Uh, with my compatriot on the OPCD side and, and dig into that a bit more. Uh, this may be something that, um, uh, this will be a multi-year process. So I think um, right now they recognize a, a big body of work, but I, I don't believe that the executive has a, a firm detailed work plan. So this could be something that a, a SLI or some other direction from council setting expectations could could help um, establish what what you want to see and report back to council. Okay, great. Calvin, thank you for walking us through all of this. Is there anything else on this slide? All right, let's keep going. Okay, next slide, please. So um, issue, uh, issue eight is really just to highlight some of the SDOT equity investments that are in the proposed budget. So these are specific funding proposals directed at historically underserved communities. I just wanted to highlight that there is funding for the 8th Avenue Street End Park as part of the Duwamish Valley Action Plan. There is funding for uh, pedestrian and uh, public space improvements in five specific uh, targeted neighborhoods as part of SDOT's reset program. There are improvements to the Detective Cookie Chess Park, and there is ongoing funding for SDOT's uh, Transportation Equity Work Group. Wonderful. Okay, next. Great. Next slide, please, Patty. Uh, I think this should be slide nine, Uh, it says slide eight, but should be uh, the ninth issue. Um, COVID-19 response programs. So to help accommodate social distancing and provide more public space uh, in the right of way, SDOT's been sort of rolling out a number of programs um, uh, in response to the pandemic the last two years. The Safe Starts um, Cafe Streets program allowed businesses to make uh, uh, structural improvements in the right of way and to allow for outdoor vending and food service. Uh, SDOT is currently developing a proposal to make this program permanent for council's consideration, hopefully in early 2022. Um, but the proposed budget does not by itself uh, include any budget changes uh, with that. So presumably those uh, proposals would come together with, uh, with a, a, a proposal to council. The Stay Healthy Streets program built on the Neighborhood Greenways uh, a program to encourage non-motorized use of streets. And this year, SDOT is completing some permanent improvements at uh, Greenwood, Beacon Hill, and Bell Street locations and developing additional proposals for making 
existing locations permanent in 2022, but the proposed budget does not include funding for additional construction of permanent um, safe, healthy streets. And then finally, the Keep, Keep Seattle Moving program uh, closed streets to vehicle traffic in locations near Seattle parks. So these included Green Lake Way, Lake Washington Boulevard, Alki Point, and Golden Gardens. Uh, recently, Green Lake Way was reopened to traffic with a two-way shared path, um, uh, but the proposed budget does not include uh, any funding for other permanent improvements in 2022. Uh, to my knowledge, Lake Washington Boulevard is still envisioned as a summer summer program. Uh, I believe the Alki Point uh, uh, temporary closures are still in place, and uh, the Golden Gardens closure is no longer being used. Any questions? Not seeing any questions on this one. Okay. Um, next slide, please. So there are two pieces of budget legislation that were transmitted with the budget. Uh, the first is the car share fee ordinance. Um, this would change the permit fee structure that's in place for free floating car share, and it would move it from a parking based cost model to a per trip cost model. So this would reduce permit fees by about $150,000. Um, under the current parking based model, uh, the program generates about 340000 in those use fees. Uh, there's also an administrative fee that would continue to be collected uh, under the new legislation. Um, but this would move to a, a, a per trip fee structure of $0.50 cents per trip uh, in a vehicle with an internal combustion motor and $0.25 cents per trip for electric vehicles. The legislation would also authorize SDOT to determine what an equitable geographic coverage should be for free, free floating car share services. Um, currently in the code, uh, we require that car share companies offer service across the entire city within two years of beginning operations. Um, so this proposed legislation would give SDOT discretion to consider um, feasibility and fleet size, uh, specific service areas with, with uh, uh, identified needs, uh, the breadth of service, and sort of what strategies are being used to reach low-income customers. I think it's important to note that this is really being put forth in the context that uh, in 2019, the three companies that were offering these services in Seattle um, ceased local operations, and there is currently one new provider that's operating a fleet of 370 vehicles in Seattle. Any questions on this legislation? Can you remind me again? What, why why was it that the three companies ceased operations here? Um, this is just conjecture on my part, but I think uh, it, the combination of competition from um, uh, rideshare, ride hailing services, uh, other micro mobility options, and potentially the requirement to expand your service within two years to cover the entire city may have played a role in their business decisions. Thanks, Calvin. Okay, I'm not seeing, oh, excuse me, Council President, please go ahead. Can you, Calvin, I may have missed you saying this, but um, who's the who's the remaining car share the, provider? The new company is called Gig. Gig, okay. And previously we had car to go Reach Now, and LimePod. Right, right. Um, Okay. And 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 so so the so the ordinance that we're being asked to consider um I, I'm trying I'm trying to understand what the change here is programmatically, if any. Can can you give us a, I mean what's the programmatic effect of um the council's adoption of this proposed budget legislation so the the i think that it really does two things it reduces the 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 cost to the permit holder of doing business continuing to do business in seattle um, reduces that permit fee by about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. and then the second thing it does is it 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 gives some discretion to sdot to um work with the permittee to figure out what the appropriate uh, coverage service requirements should be. Uh, without this change, um, the code would require that uh, a company that's been operating for two years has to demonstrate service is available for the entire city. Um, 
beyond that, I'd, I'd have to get more feedback from the department to kind of understand uh, where those discussions have been. But um, but that was the genesis of the of the proposed legislation. Okay, so so then adopting this legislation would lift the requirement that there be more equitable geographic coverage of car share services. It would give SDOT the discretion to um, consider uh, a number of factors in determining whether the, the service provided was equitably, equitably um, delivered uh, as opposed to a, you must serve the entire city. Right, so I just, I just wanna like for clarity purposes, the current requirement is you have to have geographic equity in these programs in exchange for being able to do business here in this model, right? That's the status yes. quo. And this ordinance would give SDOT the discretion to deviate from that and not require equitable geographic coverage, presumably because it's the intent. We just lost the council president. <laughs> Uh, but I think you get her point, <laughs> Kelvin. You can, I have the same question, so I'll happy to pitch it. Did you want to add anything, Councilman Morales? Well, uh, this is the piece that, that I'm struggling with, and I think it would be helpful if we know, uh, you know, what was, what reasons the other companies really did leave. And if this is the reason, what's behind it? Um, you know, was it really costing them more to try to operate citywide or was it because there were regions of the city that they did not want to operate in is the real question. Um, and I, if we have that information, that would be very helpful. I'll be happy to engage SDOT and see what type of information is available. Um, I'm not, it's, it's not, some of it can seem like hearsay when it comes to business reasons for why uh, businesses choose to do what they do, but um, but I will get an answer from SDOT. Okay. Um, Thank you. And the council president is trying to get back on the line here, but I know she'll, she will appreciate that. Um, that line of question from council member Morales as well and your answer, Calvin. Um, council member Herbold, anything else on this slide? Sure. Um, this is anecdotal, um, and I appreciate that Calvin's going to um, track down more information. But I remember taking uh, a meeting from uh, Car to Go a couple years ago before they ceased operate ceased operations, um, and they were taking taking my temperature for a decision that they wanted to make, which was to get permission from from SDOT to make a change in the ordinance that would um, allow them to no longer serve part of West Seattle um, because um, pe people were driving the cars downtown and but then not bringing them back until the end of the day, whereas they like to see lots of circulation of, of vehicles all throughout the day. Um, and so it just, you know, it was a part of town that people were definitely using it but they weren't getting um, the frequency of coverage and, and, and they wanted they wanted to stop serving um, that part of town. So I definitely know that it was a factor. Uh, and we do have, thank you, Council Member Herbold for the, the additional context. Uh, we do have Council President Gonzalez back. Council President, anything you wanted to add to that? We're still on the same topic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it turns out your computer will die if it's not plugged in and you're on Zoom for a long time. So just pro tip, plug it in. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think I, I think if I was picking up what Councilmember Herbold was putting down right now, I think that sort of um, punctuates or creates a, a example of of what I what I am understanding this change to be. Um, I, I am concerned about. Uh, creating this discretion um, because I do think it will uh, create some um, pretty significant inequities in terms of geographic coverage, particularly for 
low-income communities and also communities like West Seattle that um, may need to um, rely on this given how difficult it is to move about on the peninsula currently. So um, so I, I, I'd like to, I'd just like to get a little bit more information about why we are both reducing the permit fee and potentially in exchange for that, also eliminating the um, the policy goal of of requiring equi equitable geographic coverage of free floating car share services um, that does not seem like a good deal to to the people of the city and um, and I have a lot of concerns about 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 that. So if, if we could hear a little bit more about intent and um, policy goals from SDOT, that would be extraordinarily helpful to me in deciding whether or not I can support this um, budget legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you all very much. Kelvin, I know you said you're gonna look into it and chat with SDOT and we'll get, you'll get back to us on, on this topic of interest clearly to a number of council members, so appreciate it. Okay, anything else, Kelvin? No, uh, one last uh, piece of budget legislation. Next slide, please. So there is also a proposal to update the street use fee ordinance. Um, we do this fairly regularly. It updates the hourly service rates and permit fees. Um, while the cost of permit fees would generally increase, the proposal does include consolidating some administrative and filing fees that had been previously charged separately. Uh, the proposal also creates a new street improvement light permit, which is a, a less expensive permit for small improvement projects. And it also maintains the existing free permit programs for block parties, safe streets, and, and, and similar types of programs. Any questions? I, in my issue paper, there is a table to try to highlight what the impact of, of the permit fee changes are to different uh, permits and customers. Okay, thank you for this table as well. Um, I am not seeing any specific questions from my colleagues. I do see street improvement light. That's a decrease. It's a new program. So it, it sort of um, creates a new pathway for some of these smaller street improvements. So for, for right now, everything kind of falls under the large street improvement program, uh, a permit. And uh, this sort of carves out a, a, a lesser cost for sort of smaller scale improvements. Okay. It, it currently is, um, is it it's currently being categorized under utility major? Uh, utility major or the, the regular street improvements. There's, the, yeah. there's, there's a line I think there that that's, um, I think it's just below that line. Yeah, they all have the same dollar amount. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay, all right. Calvin, thank you for walking us through this presentation. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson, for your comments and context as well as uh, Chair of uh, Transportation. And I wanna thank all of you for the robust discussion, questions and ideas that you put out there for today. Um, I think that concludes our SDOT overview. So thank you, Calvin, for all the work that you've done. And this may come as a surprise to folks, but we are right on time according to my script. Uh, we are going to move into item number two on items of business. Madam Clerk, can you please read item number two on the record? Agenda item two, alternatives to police response and the criminal legal system for briefing and discussion. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for being here with us, Asha Van Drunkum. And um, colleagues, I think we will try to get through the first few slides and we will then have additional comments um, after the first overview slides and background. And then before we get into issue identification, we will have the chance for um, council members to make comments. Uh, council member Herbold, we'll start with you as it relates to uh, the public safety aspects. Thank you, Asha. Please go ahead, welcome. Well, good morning, council members. I'm Asha Venkatraman with your council central staff. Uh, as you can see, we'll be talking through alternatives to police response and the criminal legal system. Uh, I'll provide an overview of the paper and some background about how we'll be discussing it, then turn it over to some of my colleagues um, to discuss the specific subject matter included in the paper. So 
Now, the 2022 proposed budget includes a variety of proposals that would reduce the public's involvement with law enforcement and decrease uh, involvement with the criminal legal system um, in three primary ways. By developing alternatives to police responses for calls to service, uh, funding approaches other than prosecution and incarceration, and then making investments in community-led solutions to public safety. And so to help us weave through uh, the complexities of these investments, the paper and the presentation are split into these three main sections. So as you'll see in the budget summary table, um, the piece around alternatives to police response lists a variety of investments in that area. Uh, I just wanted to be clear that both this and the other sections don't note everything that the city currently funds, um, primarily those things that have implications in the 2022 proposed budget. And the funding is scattered across departments, so including the Human Services Department, uh, the Seattle Fire Department, the City Attorney's Office, and the courts. And so within the alternatives to police response, um, you'll see there's entries related to mobile integrated health, the Community Safety and Communication Center, uh, administrative response, crisis response units, and crisis lines. And so in the 2021 adopted budget, we were looking at about $20.4 million related to those responses. Uh, and that has increased by about 20, almost 26%, up to $26.9 million in the 2022 proposed budget. In terms of alternatives to prosecution and jail, uh, we're looking specifically at pre-filing diversion and electronic home monitoring subsidies. Those were funded at about $640,000 dollars in the 2021 adopted budget and uh, has a proposed increase of about 52 percent up to nine hundred and seventy five thousand uh, dollars in the 2022 proposed budget next slide please looking at community-led public safety investments uh, you'll see there's a variety of programs um, all of which that are currently in hsd um, but those programs were funded at about 24.2 million dollars in 2021 um, and have decreased by 13.5% um, to about $20.9 million in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So this presentation um, is divided into several parts. Um, as I mentioned, I'll provide just a basic introduction and background to the presentation itself and the considerations in the issue ID paper. And then I'll turn it over to my colleagues to talk about alternatives to police response, which will include both the categories of alternatives, uh, how you all might consider implementing those alternatives, and then issue identification. Uh, then we'll move on to the alternatives about prosecution and jail. Uh, we'll get into the background and issue ID there, as well as background and issue ID about community-led public safety investments. Next slide, please. In terms of background, um, you'll note in the paper that there are a variety of reports that are referenced that have recommendations and principles related to the criminal legal system. Um, and these reports are a result of earlier discussions in the 2019 adopted budget regarding the city's alignment along investments and policies um, and some of the lack of alignment that existed uh, throughout the city um, in various departments and the various branches of government that are related to the criminal legal system. It also incorporates council's considerations of the racial disproportionality uh, that exists both nationwide and locally um, in the criminal legal system. And so the, the recommend excuse me, the principles that are referenced on the slide here come from the Community Task Force Report on the Criminal Legal System, um, which you might have heard about um, in the Public Safety and Human Services Committee in September. And so these principles are intended to inform the Council's consideration of the criminal legal system in general. And so they consist of the pieces around divesting from the system and investing in communities, supporting community capacity to respond to harms, <clears throat> excuse me, independent of the system and the city, providing resources and funding to community organizations and priori prioritizing survivor support. Next slide, please. In addition, you uh, might have heard about the Criminal Legal System Strategic Plan, which is also a report that came from the, the Council's requests back in 2019. Uh, this strategic plan was heard in the Public Safety and Human Services Committee uh, back in June of this year. Um, and its analysis is based on a variety of community guiding principles. And the ones listed here on the slide are those that are related to people that are already involved in the system. Um, so I won't go through and read all of them, um, but they have similar themes um, to the task force report 
in the sense that the city should reduce um, unequal and disparate treatment, um, compassionately and com competently engage with people um, experiencing homelessness and mental illness, uh, finding alternatives to formal law enforcement, looking at root causes and increasing alternatives um, to the system in the form of diversion, decriminaliz decriminalization um, and alternatives to arrest. Uh, at this point, I, if there are no questions, I will turn it over to my colleagues to talk about alternatives to police response. Well, let's take a few questions here before we get into those alternatives. Um, Council Member Herbold, please go ahead. Uh, not a question, just a clarification. Um, Asha mentioned the um, committee briefing from the uh, Criminal Legal System Task Force in my in my committee. Um, there was a prior briefing uh, from central staffer um, who w we actually brought on to develop the strategic plan. And um, we also had a had a briefing in um, in my committee um, with Carlos before before he left. It was a time time limited position to develop the strategic plan. And he presented, I believe um, it was maybe in July. Um, and, and I just lift that up because there's some differences, right? There are diff some differences between the strategic plan as developed by, um, by central staff and, um, and the, um, the um, recommendations of the um, criminal legal uh, system task force members. And there's, there's a lot of alignment too. But um, since Asha is um, lifting up the task force recommendations, I did want to make sure we didn't forget um, the great report that um, Carlos put together a as well. That is, I think it's part of a whole, I, I think is how, how, how I would like to think of it. Um, and when we think about the strategic plan, I think we should think of, um, think of it again as as um, as a whole that includes both the task force recommendations and um, the I don't know year year two year long work of our central staff on this project thank you thank you very much um thanks for that context council member herbal and I think we can go ahead and continue Good morning, Council Members. Uh, Ann Gorman, Council Central Staff. Um, my role here is to walk through what we mean by alternatives to police response to provide context for some issue identification in this area. Um, when we talk about alternatives to police response, um, broadly speaking, we mean any response to an incident that is not 100% comprised of law enforcement. Um, that response could have zero participation from law enforcement or it could be law enforcement um, with a civilian responder. Um, typically, this is someone who has training in mental and behavioral health. And just to set the scene, the study of alternatives to police has expanded over the past several years in recognition of the fact that a large number of service calls do have a mental and behavioral health component and that a law enforcement response is not only inappropriate some of these to some of these calls, but may actually compound the stress of people at the scene. Um, at the same time, there are situations in which a law enforcement response is exactly what is needed. And all of the alternatives that we're going to walk through today would have the effect of uh, freeing up law enforcement to concentrate on the work that they are uniquely trained and sworn to do. So this slide lists various categories or elements of alternatives to police response, um, but something we want to emphasize is that any one programmatic solution could weave together elements of two or more of these categories. The first one on the list is mobile integrated health. These are non-emergency resources and treatment provided by a mobile care provider or providers. Um, providers come to the scene, come to people wherever they are, uh, their goal is to meet the immediate need and, and move on potentially to serve somebody else. Uh, sometimes the person at the scene has a need that cannot be met right, right there and right then. Perhaps there is an underlying substance abuse issue or the person's underlying need is for shelter. And in that case, there is typically a mental or behavioral health 
person on the scene who can help connect the person to services that will be of assistance in the future. They can provide referrals. A uh, couple different kinds of uh, mobile integrated health. Um, there is medical and non-medical mobile integrated health. The city currently has a medical MIH program. This is Health One in the Seattle Fire Department. Uh, two firefighters and a counselor from HSD um, come to people and provide the services they need, in some cases the referrals they need, and again, move on to the next person who needs assistance. Just as a note, all firefighters are EMTs, so that is the healthcare component of this model. The city also has a non-medical MIH program. This is the Crisis Response Unit in SPD. Uh, the responders are uh, an officer with crisis intervention training and a counselor from HSD. Uh, typically, uh, as in the Health One program, the counselor can attend to the scene and also make referrals to ongoing services. 2022 proposed budget includes a proposal for another non-medical MI8 unit. This can be called Triage One and located in the fire department as a complement to Health One. A um, couple key differences between Health One and Triage One. First of all, these responders in the post program would only attend the scene of non-medical, non-emergency calls. Uh, and something to note here is that this program is acknowledging an unmet need for mental and behavioral health response. Uh, second, the proposal includes the triage team responders responding to person down calls and performing welfare checks. Health One does not perform this work. Um, both of those bodies of work are currently in SPD, and they are among 29 call types that are being analyzed for potential feasibility of civilian response. No decision yet on that from SPD. Uh, and table please one. remind us the timeline for when we expect those decisions. Uh, I do not have that information yet. I will check on that and follow up. Uh, table one on page eight of the memo summarizes. Uh, Council President, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Anne. Um, you are doing a fantastic job, by the way. It's <laughs> wonderful to see you on the screen. We haven't had a chance to welcome you officially to this forum, so it is great to see you, Anne Gorman from Central Staff. Um, I did see Council Member Hervold and Greg pop in real quick. Uh, maybe and just we're, pro talk. we're probably popping in for the same reason. Um, they're telling us quarter one, end of quarter one. End of quarter one. Yeah. Okay. There, um, there's a there's a discussion about whether or not we want them just to do the 29 call types now and get that over with, or to do the whole analysis of all 50% of um, call types that the Nick Jr. report says may not need an arm response. Um, they're telling us that they can do they can do the big list just as quickly as they can do the small list, and they. Mm -hmm are saying they can get us report by the end of Q1. But um, I, I was somebody who was really wanting them to focus on that, uh, the, the smaller numbers, since there was strong agreement that that was a number that um, we, the sort of lower, low hanging fruit. Um, but if we can actually confirm that they can, they can do the big job in the same amount of time, I don't have a big problem with that. Thank you, Council Member Herbold. It would be ideal to get information before our budget process, but appreciate that how fast and hard you've been uh, working with them to try to get that list. Um, Greg, good to see you again. Any additional context? Oh, thanks. Just one quick follow up. Uh, Council Member Herbold, I think, got all of the timing down. Uh, in my presentation this afternoon on police, I will be calling out that SPD will be asking in the 2022 proposed budget to use 260000 of their salary savings on. Uh, development of the software to complete this project. So I uh, just want to uh, highlight that now so that when I get to it this afternoon, you you uh, you have a marker for it. Thanks. Appreciate it. A preview of a robust discussion to come this afternoon. I am glad we are starting with the alternatives conversation and apologies for the interruption. Please go ahead. It is, it is all welcome information. Um, the memo also has some information about the mobile crisis team, which is a King County program for which council included funding in the 2021 uh, adopted budget. That funding continues in the 2022 proposed budget. Um, are there any questions specific to mobile integrated health before I go on? This, this definitional stuff takes a little while. Uh, great, great. Thanks for pausing. Um, I do see a question from council member Lewis. 
Um, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and Anne, thank you so much for the, um, getting us started here. I, I just wanted to ask real quickly at the beginning here, uh, of these responses, what is and isn't a direct 911 responder? Because my understanding is the mobile integrated health team, they are uh, a team that responds after a 911 first responder gets there and, and flags them. Um, as someone to come out, is that uh, the case? I just wanna confirm what is like a first responder in this list and what is a secondary responder? The health one can also be directly dispatched based on the information that is conveyed in a 911 call. No, I know health one can. Uh, I was asking about the, uh, um, like the DESC crisis intervention folks. Uh, I, I believe I believe that team needs to be uh, summoned to the scene by a first responder. I, I can I can check on that and and confirm. I can, that was what I was just seeking clarification on. Thank you. Uh, I can give confirmation to that. So the so the first responders can uh, reach out to the mobile crisis team to come in response to a, a call. There is a pathway um, where the crisis can. Uh, Crisis connections or a designated crisis responder can also call on the mobile crisis team. Uh, so there are some other pathways, but I think the one that we're most familiar with is where first responders call the MCT to the site. Thank you, Jeff Sims of Central Staff. Good to see you as well. Thanks for the early response as well from Greg Doss from Central Staff. Lisa K, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I see you on screen. I don't. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's good to see you too. Um, take, takes a team here. Uh, wonderful. Appreciate that, Anne. Thanks for the question, Councilmember Lewis. And um, it, it is a great question teeing up some of the first uh, issue identification issues that I think we'll get to as well. So appreciate it. So uh, I will I will move on. Uh, another type of alternative to police response is the civilianization of officer functions. So based on the structure of the triage one proposal, um, you can see that it includes both items one and items two on this list. It's it's got an MIH focus and it includes some civilianization of officer functions. Uh, something that the memo goes into detail about is the historic role of uniformed police officers other than as responders. For instance, um, you know, participating in community meetings and supporting city health programs. And we know that many members of BIPOC communities, for instance, are made uncomfortable by this kind of police presence. And the SPD community service officers' backgrounds um, and their, and their connections to the communities they work in may make their presence more welcome at events like this in contrast to law enforcement officers. And I know that Greg will talk a bit about the community service officers this afternoon. Next item, uh, administrative responses to service calls. It may also be possible for civilians to take on some of this work. Administrative responses are things like taking reports of minor accidents and property destructions. At the same time as SPD is working on its analysis of call types, central staff is also working with the city attorney's office to understand whether there are any call types that require by state law, a law enforcement response. And I should just note for items two and three, anytime we are talking about potential transfer of work, um, we are talking about bargaining with any affected union. Crisis lines can also be an alternative to police response in that they provide a resource to people who are having a mental or behavioral health crisis. People answering those phones provide advice, support, information, other numbers to call to, to get more specialized help. Um, there are several of these operating in Seattle, including the one call pilot, which I believe Jeff just referred to, that lets emergency responders call crisis connections for help when they are on scene and someone is having a crisis. Uh, there's $403,000 in the 23 proposed budget in HSD to extend that pilot program. Um, coming online soon is a new statewide 988 system that will launch in the middle of next year. This will be a new number that people can call 24 hours a day when they're considering self-harm or having a mental or behavioral health crisis. Um, and none of these crisis line options allow for the dispatch of therapeutic resources to the person who is calling. 
Um, finally, I want to touch on dispatch protocols. These protocols are the questions that lead callers, excuse me, that call takers lead callers through when they call 911. The scripts and decision trees in these protocols help a dispatcher send the appropriate response. Again, right now, the only responses that we can send are SPD and SFD. The 2021 mid-year supplemental included funding in the CSCC to create a standardized interrogation protocol in that department, which would lead to the collection of more consistent data and would also support the equitable provision of services. This data might be useful in the future to help guide the development of new non-police dispatch protocols. Um, any questions here before we move on to the next slide? Councilmember Herbal, please go ahead. Um, not, not so much a question, just getting back to um, Councilmember Lewis's earlier question about which of these categories um, are um, directly dispatched. Um, and, and, and the fact that it's fairly limited right now, right? And we have, a, I think, a policy interest in, in, in growing the alternatives that can be dispatched. Um, but the funding that the council provided a couple months ago for the dispatch protocols is a necessary precondition um, you know, right now, the um, the questions that dispatch asks and has answered uh, when somebody calls 911 are fairly simple. And it, they're, they're simple because they only need to get you to one or two alternatives. As soon as you start adding more alternatives, the questions necessarily um, become more complex and look more like a decision tree. So um, that's why I think um, the council did a good thing by not waiting until um, this discussion um, about next year's budget in order to fund those dispatch protocols because it's really important to get them in place before we have any additional um, responders um, who are being dispatched from 911. Thank you, Council Member Herbold. And um, Anne, if you have any comments on that, you're welcome to. I also see Council Member Morales's hand. Please go ahead. Yeah, if, if I could, if I could clarify, the, the current investment in the CSCC would not be sufficient to get us to a place where we were able to dispatch non-SPD, non-SFD resources. There, there would have to be another investment uh, before that became possible. But it's 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 a good it's a good base set of data and uh the current investment would definitely support any future investments wonderful thank you um councilmember morales please go ahead thank you um and i'm hoping you can help me sort some things out um so i'm looking at uh, page 10 of the memo, it talks about the Nick Jr. report, about 80% of the calls, at least within this two-year period, were not criminal. Um, uh, the report recommends that alternative response options should be developed for the 70% of calls that do not require law enforcement. Um, but then it says uh, that we're really only going to be looking at 12% of calls to try to shift away. Is that because we just haven't ramped up or is there some other reason why um, we're only looking to, uh, to try to divert 12% of the anticipated calls? I let me let me follow up on that. I'm I'm aware. I, I have seen this 30%, um, 12% uh, um a seeming inconsistency uh referenced before um i i i have i am i am not as as schooled as some of my colleagues are in the in the nick jr report but i i will follow up about that i do know that these these 29 call types were um they they were they were the low-hanging fruit if you were i I, I, I am not aware that anyone is thinking of of these 29 call types as the the end of the story oh it's greg thank you greg <laughs> thank you appreciate it 
Councilmember Morales, uh, the, just just for a little bit of background, and I think you're familiar, the Nick Jr. study uh, divided uh, call types into four different categories. The, the tier that has the 29 call types that we've been talking about is the one that uh, basically uh, an officer is is not required. Um, they're they're pretty much for the most part for the most part non criminal. Um, there are they are still potentially some that have risk, and that's why SPD risk to injury of a civilian, and that's why SPD is 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 doing an analysis on them. SPD is going to uh, continue to do analysis on other calls that are non-criminal calls, calls that might extend into the other tiers. Um, and they have a project risk to management software that would uh, continue to do that kind of uh, risk analysis to determine what a civilian could safely go to. So that is a, a project that is in the pipeline, so to speak. Uh, it's not something that's totally being forgotten. It's just um, more of a next step. And it's a project that is uh, one that I'll talk about um, this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Let's go on to two of two here. Thank you, Patty. Um, so if the council did want to implement one or more of these alternatives, what might that look like? Um, one option would be to locate additional functions and or staffing that support alternatives to police response in the C CSCC. Uh, the CS was set up to provide, and I'm reading here, uh, civilian and community-based services and solutions to community safety challenges. And council could determine that it is the appropriate place from which to direct um, non-medical therapeutic responders. Um, one note here is that in its current location, the CSCC is space constrained and would not be able to add additional staff on site. Another option would be to locate alternatives to police response in SFD, consistent with the executive's proposal for the new triage team. Um, that team would require uh, HSD and SFD staff working together, and it would rely on SFD fleet vehicles. Another option would be to partner with a community-based service provider on a mobile integrated health solution, perhaps as a pilot program. Um, other cities have done this. Uh, what it might look like is a contract with a local nonprofit that has experience providing mental and behavioral health services. Um, the appendix outlines a few approaches along those lines, and there are both benefits and drawbacks to this model. And if council wanted to analyze any particular framework, central staff would be available to support that effort. Wonderful, thank you. I see Council Member Lewis, I believe first, and then Council Member Herbold. Uh, Council Member Lewis, did you have a question? Well, I'll defer to letting Council Member Herbold go first. Oh, okay, and, Great. and then I, I would like to jump in after, thank you. Great, collegiality team. Yes. Uh, oh. Please go ahead, Council Member Herbold. And you described, um, Option three as a potential pilot, but we already fund a program that would fit that definition, right? The um, mobile crisis team through DESC? This, this this could be a pilot that would provide for the the dispatch of um, mental and behavioral uh, healthcare resources to the so, scene where it is needed. Right. So the yeah, difference would be how it not the service provided, but how it was accessed. Yes, correct. Yeah, thank, thank you for thank you for the opportunity to to to, to clarify. Um, no, that's the, a help. It's uh, when when we talk about uh, the potential to contract, um, that is not in reference to changing what is currently happening in SFD. Thank you. Thank you, and Councilmember Lewis, did you have any follow up? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, just, just to jump on that same theme, I, I mean, as we discussed a little bit earlier, the, that DESC team is not a first response uh, function currently. Um, it is something that is gate kept by a different provider. And I don't, I don't necessarily think in, in sort of my vision and having studied some of these um, provider-based response programs in other cities, um, that I am necessarily talking about just giving a first response capability to that DESC team. 
I, I think I'm I'm talking more about developing an intermediary service that could be the an alternative gatekeeper that responds first to the scene and then if they need that higher acuity service can summon the DESC team uh, because I, I don't actually think that in the majority of calls for service there's necessarily the need for that high of acuity um, level of response. Uh, I think in a lot of cases you could see a low acuity um, provider based service responding to things like um, like trespass or uh, um, some of the kind of person down calls that the triage team is envisioned to respond to that don't necessarily require the, the more intense um, capability of the DESC team and would operate, uh, you know, at a lower overall um, potential cost in, in sort of what's envisioned. So I think it's a, a little bit more um, complicated. I think that there's a little bit of overlap with the triage team concept. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just bookmark this uh, for, for future comments as we get into the different services a little bit more. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to do that, um, Madam Chair, or if we want to wait for a future slide. Yeah, let's take some more comments and questions about the slides that we've seen already, and then we can kind of um, hold those pieces for the issue ID, if that sounds okay, Councilmember Lewis. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, yeah, but I, I, do, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate I appreciate you taking that up, and, and I think similar to the conversations we've had, you know, this month, last month, um, the big issues that we're hearing from some of these first responders, especially fire, is they need a landing place for the people they see. So it's less about who that first responder is in every case and more about who can they refer out to. Um, and I think that's those are some of the questions that I'll be asking as well. Yes, we want that first responder in many ways to not necessarily be these people with a, a, a gun showing up when what we need is a medical unit or people with the ability and training to treat the mind and body. Um, and then the bigger question is, then where do they go? Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll tee up some of those questions for the issue ID to here to come. I want to see if there's any additional questions on the previous slides that we've seen before we get into issue ID here. Okay, and you were uh, really, really helpful, I think, in helping to explain to folks what alternatives look like. And uh, thank you for your comprehensive overview. I did have one question on the previous slide before we move on, but I want to just double check. And did you, were you able to conclude your comments for the background slide? Uh, I just, I just want, um, I, I just want to agree with some of the, some of the council members who, who have commented that um, it's, it's, it's a complex area designing um, an MIH program. And the program is necessarily going to be responsive to the specific needs that a community has identified. Um, it is it is in no way one size fits all. And uh, the table that we've put together showing how other cities have chosen to step forward really illustrates the fact that they all look a little bit different. So there is there is real opportunity to to craft the appropriate tool for the need. Find the mute button. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then a quick comment, just briefly, if I might, Patty. Sorry, um, if we can go to background one of two. I just wanted to make sure that I understood what you said on item number four here, and also for the viewing public. When we talk about the crisis line that's being developed at the state level, that was for individuals who themselves are having a crisis. If they um, are experiencing a mental health crisis, if they're having um, suicidal thoughts there's going to be a statewide number. However, that is not a new number for calling if you see somebody having a crisis or if you're worried about the health and safety of somebody else, right? That's not for... Yes, that's that's correct. I think I think if you're if you're in the same room as someone who is in crisis, the the, the new 988 number um, might be a really good resource to have. But um, but yes, you're you're correct in your your, your picture is accurate. Yeah, if you see somebody potentially on the street um, having maybe an episode or needing assistance, that's not the right number to call. Um, and, and that's why we're working, I think, to uh, issue identification number one that you're getting to, to making sure that we 
have a triage model behind the scenes when 911 is called so that the appropriate person then gets deployed for those emergency situations and that appropriate person could be someone with a mental health um, and case management background along with the health services that you mentioned. Okay, let's get into issue identification here. Okay, issue number one, um, this, this concerns callers who are dealing with a mental or behavioral crisis and would ideally like for therapeutic resources to come to the scene of that crisis. Uh, currently, the city is not able to dispatch such resources, but council members may wish to start planning for that. Um, option A would add funding for a study that recommends a plan for a non-911 crisis response line and for various ways that that line could be staffed. Um, option B, no action, not going to do that. Okay, any thoughts on these options? Let's do it. <laughs> um, you know, the one the one caveat or maybe caution I would put out there is I think the goal is still trying to civilianize 911. We want people to be able to call 911 because they're, they've been um, trained and conditioned to do that. But behind the scenes, again, we're hoping that there was more options. So on the dispatch side, we can deploy the appropriate person. We want to make sure that we we stay um, connected to that vision and setting setting up a clear choice for folks um, to to know that when they call 911, there will be a healthy, safe alternative to policing uh, still available is, is my goal. Councilmember Herbold. Thanks, I just wanna note here, um, I am of the understanding that the state crisis, um, the funding for uh, through the state for a, a crisis line, a non uh, first responder crisis line is not only for people who are in crisis it is a it's my understanding and we had folks come in um and present in a, in a round table it was a couple months ago so i will have to go back and check but is my understanding is they are looking at setting up or supporting jurisdictions and, and ours would go through king county but it's with state money to set up crisis lines for for us to call if we see somebody in crisis. Um, and I believe it's Crisis Connections that's going to be doing that work. They kind of, they take some of those calls now, today. Um, again, not just for somebody who is in crisis themselves, but for somebody who is looking to help somebody in crisis. So um, I would just ask, obviously this is something that I, I want us to do, but before we go down the road of funding a study, um, I would really want to have a super clear understanding of what is uh, being funded with um, with the state funding and, and, and what the plan is for King County with crisis connections. Thank you, Council Member Herbold. I see Amy Gore. Hey, Amy from Central Staff, welcome to the screen again. Thank you. I was just going to mention um, with just to build on what Council Member Herbold said, I went back and um, read the original um, legislation. And I think that one of the challenges we're having here is there was not ambiguity, but um, there's kind of a gap between what the um, actual legislation says and what that implementation will look like. Um, and exactly what the parameters of the call line look like. And I believe that, um, like say this is on the King County side and on the state side, and that they have um, some um, stakeholder groups and some um, community groups that are working on figuring out those details. And we'll try and connect back in with them um, to make sure that we know exactly where they are right now as they develop these um, program details and implementation before next year. Okay, that'd be great. Sorry, and I and thank you for the clarification. Um, that would be very helpful to know if, if that is intended for people who are concerned about the health and safety of a situation as well. And appreciate Amy and Anne, um, your joint work on that effort. Um, and, and perhaps we do need to have some more conversations about this, colleagues, as, as we figure out what the next step is here and on the options that have been identified. Um, again, I think a lot of folks are trained to call 911 if they still pick up the phone and dial 911 like I have done when I've seen folks in crisis. Um, I think we still want there to be the deployment of that triage system that is underway right now so that the, the right 
person shows up for the situation um, that is being reported. And uh, given how many people just intuitively call 911 versus having to be retrained on, an, on a different number, perhaps there's a way for us to to figure out the, the right system behind the scenes. So I, I do have a number of questions about A here. Um, and at this point, you know, would love to ch chat more with you all about the ways in which we can get the 911 system and the triage work that you all have been working on and council member Herbal that you've been leading on, how we get that deployed so that the right person shows up. So just signaling um, interest in knowing more about how and how that is uh, coming along how quickly that can be deployed versus setting up a completely new number at the local level. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, uh, this this issue concerns uh, SFD's proposal for the new triage for the new triage one team. Um, the, as, as I noted, there is some overlap between the proposed new program and the existing program. We've also talked with SFD about the implementation timeline for the proposed new program, and they don't believe they would be able to stand it up until quite late in 2022. Uh, the proposal requests 2.15 million of general fund resources, but a lot of that is staff costs and would not be expended in 2022. Um, the proposal also contemplates moving some bodies of work from, SF, from SPD to SFD, but SPD has not yet reached the conclusion that this is feasible, and if and when they do, it will be subject to uh, bargaining. So acknowledging some constraints, um, we've prepared a couple options about, uh, about the, the new proposed mobile integrated health unit. Um, that funding could be reallocated to a contracted mobile integrated health program. Um, we could establish a new mental, mental and behavioral crisis response unit in the CSCC rather than SFD. Um, because there would not be a need for medical assistance for these calls. Um, we could adjust the parameters of the Health One and or triage team programs to align with the council's vision and goals for 911 dispatch of therapeutic resources, or we could take no action. That's number Herbal, please go ahead. I'm a little bit confused with um, the characterization that the triage one, the proposed triage one unit is not materially different from the existing health one program. Um, we talked earlier in this presentation about how the calls that triage one is proposing to take are not calls that health one takes. There, there would, there, there would be, there would be overlap between the two programs. Um, both of the programs would, both of the programs would perform outreach to people on the streets. Um, sometimes it's it's not easy to tell from the initial call whether or not medical assistance is needed. Um, and we also understand from SFD that a number of the call types that uh, Health One is currently responding to do not have a medical component. Um, we have a, a list of those call types from them. Um, they're, uh, they are they are not the same program, but there there is some overlap. I'd definitely like to uh, learn more about that. Is my understanding again that um, Triage One is only proposing to handle at this at this stage two call types, um, and they're not call types that Health One takes. So um, would really like I said, love love to learn more. Thank you. I see Councilmember Lewis's hand. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to get into to this a little bit more, and, and I appreciate how these options were presented, just speaking more broadly from the like the highest um, level on this, I actually don't think there would be anything wrong with 2022 being a year where uh, we try multiple different ways to deploy the teams monitor the results and the impact and then make decisions in 2023 about what we want to scale up or what we want to scale down. Um, I think that that would probably be a combination of A, 
and end B in the sense that we maybe fund a pilot program for a pro provider based response um, to, to respond to similar call types um, as the triage one team and that maybe there's a decision to divide response areas geographically or maybe to mix and match with the response types. Because I think we've seen from a lot of different cities that there are certain inherent advantages of deploying some of these services through a provider in terms of, uh, you know, having the service be non-uniformed, having the service be infused with uh, a lot of the um, uh, criminal legal system divestment principles of community organizations. Uh, I think that there's like, it, that's attractive. I understand for a lot of reasons um, uh, the preference of the executive to establish a new team within uh, within one of our legacy uh, emergency response departments. Um, I understand, you know, for for liability and some other reasons that there's thoughts that that might be um, a better practice. Uh, but I do think that this is a time to really uh, experiment with some different models and really try to get something out in the community faster. You know, what I hadn't really been thinking about until the slide is that uh, contracting some kind of response system might actually be faster than putting, than setting it up in a department. I hadn't really thought about that before and maybe central staff could expand a little bit on, on whether, uh, um, giving money to HSD, for example, to bid some kind of first response that is hardwired into 911 uh, might allow that to, to be stood up quicker or, you know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong about that. Uh, but the last thing I would just say is, you know, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about here, just to kind of, you know, like make it simple, is, you know, some service that is composed of an EMT and a mental health clinician in a van that's equipped to respond to low acuity situations uh, that currently um, people are not getting any kind of service response for, um, be it a person in distress uh, or be it a um, small business owner who is essentially having to deal with that on their own in terms of trying to de-escalate a person or meet a person's needs because the city isn't sending anyone out to, to functionally um, do anything or assist uh, with that situation. And I just want to make sure whenever we're envisioning this, that we're really thinking that regardless of how it's composed, it's basically going to be the same fundamental uh, personnel deployed through a van, um, as we've seen in, in multiple other cities. And, you know, I, I just want to keep that keep that grounded as we figure out how to deploy it, because uh, I, I worry that uh, we inadvertently could make something complicated that could be fairly simple um, in terms of the team composition and just figuring out the way to get it up and get it out to meet the very real need that we see in the community right now. Councilmember Herbal, please go ahead. Yeah, and you know, to the point of urgency, I think it's really, um, again, some context setting. Um, I do want to recognize that um, there have been, there has been work for many years to have um, alternative response with um, with when when the uh, mental health unit was first stood up and um, Health One was developed. This is this is work that uh, predates the racial reckoning in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, but. Um, when this entire council began um, engaging even more in earnest in this issue, um, you know, we were talking about ramping up an alternative um, with the idea in mind that we would, we, we had at that, at the same point um, that we were providing the funding and the, um, the infrastructure for planning for an alternative response, uh, over the course of 2021, we had um, that fall uh, approved a budget of uh, for 1,000 
343 officers. This council did not vote in uh, uh, to support a hiring freeze um, in, in 2021. Um, and so I, I think we, we take a lot of criticism for not having this thing built yet. <laughs> But we were we were talking about building something at that point um, to to divert a relatively small number of calls, and that we would we would build the system as we we would we would reduce funding uh, for traditional law enforcement as we were building the system, and we were talking about a system that would take over a fairly small number of calls from a, sm a fairly small number of reduced officers. And I am very frustrated, and I think we are all very frustrated, that with so many police officers leaving the department this year, having nothing at all to do with our budget actions, um, people are now asking us, why, why aren't altern more alternatives set up? And, and um, I'm, I'm very frustrated having worked on this over the course of the year with the executive, that we don't have um, something in this budget that is, um, I'm, I'm supportive of the, of the triage one unit, but I would like to see more. Um, that, that triage one unit is um, scoped, take, uh, I believe it's uh, 4,000 calls. So, um, you know, and, and this is a, you know, this is a public safety issue. This isn't, this is about making sure that people have um, the right response, don't get a police response when they don't need one. But it's also about making sure that in those instances, as Anne said, where the only response is a police response, that there are, are that officers are able to to respond to those calls. And at this point, as you know, as, as we're going to talk more this afternoon um, about 911 response times, there there are some some real issues there. So we really need to, I think, in this budget cycle, put our heads together and feel and figure out how to do something more quickly, bring it online early next year. Thank you, Councilmember Herbold. Very important reminder. And I think just putting into context the statistics that you and central staff and others have continued to raise that, you know, the Nick Jr. report and using SPD's data alone shows that at some point you know, that 80% of the calls are non-criminal in nature, that at some point in the near future, 49% of those calls should be transitioned to an alternative response. And in this very moment right now, 12% of those calls could be handled by a different entity today. Um, so with that, with those statistics, the call for urgency um, is ever more important. And I appreciate you expressing your frustration that, um, you know, this is not this is not, not not time to nibble around the edges when we have an incredible need for the right person to show up at the right time. We've spent the last two years talking about how that is not only a good thing for um, the health and safety of those who are in our, our community that are potentially faced with a gun and an officer when what they need is a mental health call. It's actually good for officers as well, as you just said, to be able to free them up to show up to uh, what they should be doing as police officers that are not mental health, case management, or housing connector calls. And appreciate, Anne, that you put that in your central staff presentation as well. Councilmember Lewis, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you. I mean, ju just really briefly, I, I mean, I completely agree with everything Councilmember Herbold said and completely share her frustration. I'm sure all of us do. Um, I think that every all the considerations Councilmember Herbold put out around urgency are good arguments um, for pursuing uh, multiple response theories at the same time in the next budget and potentially through different departments. Uh, I think that uh, having an, an HSD provider based response that, you know, that that's bidded through HSD and then having a triage team in the fire department and monitoring both of them and seeing how the calls can be mixed and matched or how they can cover different geographic areas is a good way to just start getting some stuff out into the world so that we can start actually seeing how these things can work um, in practice instead of just theory. Uh, and then um, based on those lessons, um, scaling things up. I, I do think one of the things I've been concerned about over the last year is that there has been sort of a, you know, like, it, it, there, there has been sort of an effort to to not do anything until the perfect response can be envisioned or, or developed to a certain extent. And I think it's it's sort of in a lot of these cities that have built responses like Star or Cahoots, um, 
you know, they, they were built incrementally through experimentation and through kind of, you know, plug and play and seeing what works out in the community. They, they didn't um, just, you know, come up with the perfect program and then, you know, drop it down out of the sky. So I, I think part of it is just getting, you know, some rubber on the road and seeing how these things can work. And until we, and so if we can do that in with, you know, a couple programs in a couple different departments, I think that might be a good way to do it monitor the results and then scale things up accordingly once we have more data. Okay, thank you colleagues. Um, I'll say one more thing on this slide and then we're gonna move on. Uh, I do wanna make sure that the alternative responses include the alternative front first responders who have been on the, on the front line. Uh, very, very much appreciate our firefighters and our case managers who are part of uh, Health One. We have taken that program from one to three. Hopefully in this quarter, we will see the third van from Health One come online. Um, and we want we have been respectful of them saying we need time to make sure that it's successful in other areas. I'd like to see the five ladder areas um, quickly brought onto line when there's capacity to do that. And I've heard from folks at Health One, the firefighters, Seattle Fire Department, um, the case managers that um, there is uh, a need for us to recognize the scale at which Health One is operating in a city as big as Seattle, comparably to some of the other cities that we look at. Um, they are doing a tremendous amount of work that is on par, if not even bigger than what some of the, um, you know, sort of case studies that we reference often are doing. And so how we can help stabilize them and make sure that they have the resource that resources they need now and expand that is something I'm interested in because they do have a tested and true model. And, and that said, they can't be at every one of these places and they need a place to hand it off to. So maybe it's both that um, layering of where the, where the landing place is, where the organization is that takes the handoff is as equally as important as creating um, that initial first responder um, touch point. Okay, Anne, you've spark sparked a lot of conversation before we moved on. Lisa, is there anything else you'd like to add on this? No, I'm just teeing up for slide 10. Well, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Patty. Um, and thank you, Anne. That was a great introduction. I'm Lisa Kay with Central Staff. I'm going to be just talking about the next two slides that you have in front of you um, that will show, uh, kind of flesh out and weave in some of the concepts you've already been discussing uh, to show some additional policy options. So slide 10 shows three functions that could potentially be added to the Community Safety and Communications Center. Uh, the first one you've been talking about a lot is triage one. Um, as you've heard, discussions are ongoing as to whether this should be housed in the fire department or the Community Safety and Communications Center. And one of the key factors in that decision is whether the firefighters would be part of the triage one response or if the unit, this particular unit would be fully staffed by civilians. A second potential function would be to move the community service officers unit out of the police department and into the CSCC. As described in our staff memo, uh, the CSOs are currently a civilian unit within the police department. Um, that group could potentially respond to several of the types of calls flagged by the Nick Jr. report as not requiring a police response. And then the th a third option would be to create a special unit in the CSCC to provide administrative response to some types of these 911 calls. Uh, the Nick Jr. report did note that administrative responders could potentially handle some low risk calls, which might include the things that Anne mentioned about creating accident reports for incidents without injuries or producing reports for minor thefts. One potential step to implement this could be uh, funding a pilot project at the CSCC using civilian administrative responders. And again, I would note, um, I know there's a real sense of urgency to get these stood up. Moving any of these functions into the CSCC would require a fair amount of lead time to develop uh, both the administrative capacity to run these programs and potentially to update the dispatch protocols to make sure that all of the dispatch uh, entities are integrated and that the technology that supports the dispatch is, is set up properly. Also, as Anne mentioned, some of these changes could be subject to bargaining, and some may also benefit from some written agreements to weave together the roles and responsibilities between the different entities, CSCC, police, fire, human services, and our community service providers. 
So with that, I will pause. Uh, your fourth act is obviously to take no action on adding additional functions. So before I go to slide 11, I'll see if there are any questions. Great, thanks. I'm going to take the hands in the order in which I saw them, Councilmember Lewis and then Councilmember Herbal. This is just a clarifying question, because this is the first time I've kind of been exposed to this um, administrative responder concept. Would that basically be something where uh, someone comes out in the community and takes a report uh, instead of a, a sworn officer? So, you know, if I if I wake up in the morning and the car, you know, if I had a car, I don't have a car, but if I had a car, the car to my window was broken and I call in a vehicle prowl and instead of an officer coming, an administrative responder comes, takes the report down, you know, takes pictures of my damaged car. And if something ever comes of it in the future, now there's like a report and I don't have to do the report online because there's this administrative responder. Is that the concept of, of what that would be? I couldn't tell you the exact logistics about how that would play out. I mean, I know that I've had, I've woken up and had my car missing <laughs> before. <laughs> and, and sometimes you would get a police response. Sometimes you would just talk to somebody on the phone. Um, but somebody in the department would fill out your report. They'd take your information, they file a report because when you ask for insurance um, coverage, you have to have a police report number. So that work would be done administratively and doesn't need to be done by a sworn officer according to the Nick Jr. report. So um, so it's it's likely that the scenario you played out could be in, happen. I don't know how much in-person conversation would be involved. But, but that's the kind of thing this job would would do. Yeah. I guess that's right. what I'm kind of Exactly. Asking. Okay. Yes, you are right about that. All right. Um, and presumably it's envisioned as a unarmed service. Yes. I mean, for example, if you had the CSOs do this, which there has been some conversation of doing, mm. you know, that those group, that group of individuals could potentially do it or some other unit that would not be sworn officers. Yeah. You know, one thing I would flag here that might be, might be helpful for central staff and maybe for the executive departments is under the retail theft program, loss prevention officers complete police reports, um, you know, which obviously are not sworn personnel and are not police. So I, I raise that because there's potential bargaining or labor issues that that must have been envisioned when we did the loss prevention program, um, because those are people doing reports that aren't police. And I don't know how that was taken care of, but the, this seems to touch on similar issues. And I, I would also just flag that from a customer service level at the city, you know, one thing I hear a lot of frustration about is people that don't like going through the Byzantine online reporting thing, or, you know, don't feel like the city, you know, really cares about, you know, when they do have a package stolen or when they do have their car prowled because they like, no one kind of comes out and takes a report. So I, I do think from a customer service level, it, like it is good to have some kind of service like this that could be provided and, um, you know, just flagging my interest in pursuing it and then doing it in a way that obviously doesn't involve an, an armed sworn officer. I, I would note, if, if I could, I, um, the theft loss prevention program, we did have a fair amount of discussion about that when uh, the tech committee reviewed the cop logic technology. So there is a there is a police involvement. Um, they are on the receiving end of those um, reports that are filed by the prevention officers. But but they'd be on the receiving end of these reports too, right? I mean, I think it's fundamentally the same exchange. Again, those are that's why it doesn't that's why it takes a, a little while to stand these kind of programs up because there are a lot of um, nuts and bolts to be figured out about how it actually will play out. Thanks. Um, as it relates specifically um, to option B, I want to remind everybody that um, as part of the second quarter supplemental, or I guess we call it the mid-year supplemental now, um, we um, parked the 2021 funding for the triage team in uh, 
FAS pending a report um, on um, the the program for for triage team. So I um, I see this as potentially needing some alignment because this proposes that we we tell the executive what our vision is for it, and we have just recently asked them to tell us their vision, and we're holding on to to the money um, until until we get that information. Um, and then when in Anne's comments earlier, when she was talking about the length of time, it it is likely to take um, to stand up this initial small uh, triage team. Um, it sounded like she was saying um, pretty far into 2022. And I'm wondering, is that is that irrespective of whether or not it stays in fire or goes to CSCC? Because my understanding was that um, it might take a while if we insisted on moving triage one in, into CSCC because of some of the human infrastructure, the HR issues that they're 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 um, managing right now with being a, a, a new division, but that um, the timeline for um, uh, a triage one being launched out of fire would be a, a shorter timeline. And the idea for an MOU, I think, is about. Yes, this, the the the, the long term vision um, for for triage one maybe not maybe not so much the short term because I think in the short term it's like let's just make sure we're agreeing where we're starting and let's get it launched and then let's have an MOU for for what the long term vision is that that's sort of what what I'm seeing but I would really like to know um, from from Anne whether or not she's hearing that we're not going to, it doesn't matter where triage one is launched out of, we're not going to, you're hearing from the executive, we're not going to see it until late in 2022. Yes, uh, just to confirm the timeline that SFD prepared for the program to launch from that department, um, has it, uh, you know, fully implemented as in that they're staffed up, people are trained, they're, they're going out onto the streets in December of 2022. Um, we have heard from them that um, if the program were launched out of the CSCC, it would take longer than that. But um, I, I have not followed up on specifically how much longer. Uh, would be happy to do that if it's, if it's of interest. This begs the question why there was such an urgent press release and press conference held on it in mid-2021 if 2022 end of the year is the actual launch point. Um, yeah. So I think that we'd very much like to see how fast we can move um, some of, uh, of, of those conversations along. And I'm surprised by that timeline. I know Councilmember Herbal, uh, you and I, I think we're anticipating something much quicker than that. Um, Ali, I see you on the line here. Again, welcome, Ali Panucci from Central Staff. If you have anything else to add, please feel free to. Morning, Chair Mosqueda. Thank you. I just wanted to weigh in um, or add in if, if necessary, but you, you already said it, but since Anne wasn't here at the time, I think that the story is unfolding, And but we just wanted to affirm that what, what Councilmember Herbold was communicating is what we had understood in July and August when the Council was considering the supplemental budget ask and um, it seems that the, the story has evolved a bit in terms of the, the timing. Well, that's very interesting. Um, so we will follow up with you and I think to, you know, to the conversations that um, we have had with first responders from fire as well. I know that there was a lot of concern about that program being stood up without conversations with frontline members from IAFF 27, for example. So if anything, this gives us additional opportunity to talk to firefighters themselves uh, to see how those conversations are progressing. Appreciate that, you know, the sense of urgency that we all have to try to get something stood up, but it doesn't actually help to have a press release in Jan July that then is not for a program that's potentially going to launch until December of 2022. So uh, to the points from uh, our colleagues earlier, I think there's a lot to be uh, potentially done in this budget to try to 
provide swifter action and, and um, true alternatives. Let's continue to go through this. I'm gonna try to see how far we can get in the next 20 minutes. We do have two more items on this section here and then three more issue identification pieces we don't get through them all, I do need to have a hard stop at one o'clock so we can give folks a full hour for a meal break. And um, and then we will resume at two with anything that we haven't covered, but let's see how much we can get done in the next 20 minutes here. Okay, thank you, uh, Council Member. I'll just uh, quickly go over slide 11 then, and then we will be moving into the next half of the paper. Um, so issue number four is, um, a response to low-level criminal 911 calls. So as Greg mentioned and Ann mentioned also, the police department's conducting what they call a risk-based analysis of the types of calls for service that could be handled by civilian responders with minimal risk as a follow-up to the NICTER and your recommendations. And you can see in our staff report on Appendix X is what it's called on page 26 of the issue ID paper, you'll see a list of the call types that are included in SPD's analysis. As Councilmember Herbold added, the police reports anticipated to be completed by the end of Q1 2022. Um, so that information kind of came out after these options were produced, but um, option one then would be to create a statement of legislative intent asking for a report on that risk analysis by a specific date. And now we would know that that date is Q1, end of Q1. So you could ask for that report by that date. Option two then would, um, instead add FTEs and funding to establish a unit in the in the CSCC to provide civilian response to low risk 911 calls. And that um, overlaps with some of the other discussion you've previously had. Okay, wonderful, Lisa. Uh, colleagues, any comments or questions, thoughts, responses to this one? Not seeing anyone. Um, I'd be interested in in a learning more about option A here with members of the Public Safety Committee. I'm not on that committee, but look forward to, to coordinating with the chair and other council members to see what your response is making. Okay. I read this quite a bit, so I think that it's uh, it's clear that we're interested in, in swift action on the items that could be moved over quickly. I will then turn it back to Asha to introduce a section of the paper addressing the alternatives to prosecution and jail if that meets your needs, Council Chair. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm going to be talking about alternatives to prosecution and jail. Uh, in the context of the 2022 proposed budget, we're looking specifically at two things, uh, at pre-filing diversion and at subsidies for electronic home monitoring. So I'll start talking about um, pre-filing diversion fees and then move into EHM. Currently, the city attorney's office uh, does run a pre-filing diversion program uh, that weaves together three different um, elements with looking at um, individuals accused of committing low-level misdemeanors. Um, then it expanded out to relicensing for individuals accused of driving while their license is suspended in the third degree. And then um, expanded into diversion for individuals accused of non-intimate partner or family domestic violence. In Seattle, um, in the Seattle Reentry Workgroup report, which was issued back in 2018, there was a recommendation to expand this current pre-filing diversion program for individuals that were 25 and over and to a broader set of potential misdemeanors that were eligible for diversion. Uh, the council asked for a statement of legislative intent from the city attorney's office um, to request that law evaluate looking at the staffing and resources it would take to expand the program, um, as well as providing some funding for a prevailing diversion racial equity toolkit, assessing that concept. And so the current, both the current prefiling diversion program and the um, expanded concept are issues that um, I will raise in a moment. I wanted to provide some additional context as to specific recommendations that came from the Community Task Force on uh, Criminal Legal System Alignment, as well as the RET. Those considerations are in Appendix W that are in the paper, um, but contain similar themes around um, principles that prefiling diversion should um, should align with to be to be most effective to community members. And so you'll see those elements in, um, as I said, Appendix W, um, but uh, I'll mention just a couple of them here. Um, 
Some of them are to focus on um, declining charges or decriminalization rather than um, focusing solely on diversion, uh, making sure that we're looking at root causes, um, why people commit misdemeanors, especially when they um, are crimes of poverty, um, asking that diversion be voluntary rather than compliance-based, um, flagging that it can be problematic when um, relying solely on the discretion of law enforcement officials um, and focused on eliminating barriers to accessing diversion. And so one of the specific concepts um, that is related um, because we are in budget season um, is that the budgets of the criminal legal system should not be expanded, but rather that funding programs like this that are intended to decrease um, further involvement with the system should be funded with existing funds um, into the system. And so if we can move to the next slide, um, you'll see I flagged a, a couple of things here in terms of fully staffing the existing diversion program. So as it stands in the 2022 budget, um, there is a proposal to add um, funds to make sure this program is fully staffed. Um, right now it's staffed by a part-time paralegal and two assistant city prosecutors. Uh, the pro proposed budget would um, add in an additional almost $248,000 and a strategic advisor, as well as making the paralegal um, a full-time position rather than a half-time position. So in terms of um, issues laid out about um, the aligning with principles um, for a couple of options for the council here, um, you could fund the, this proposed program in the budget and then adopt a statement of legislative intent asking that law submit a report to the council talking about how the existing program aligns with the principles both in the RET and in the task force report um, and recommend any changes um, that would allow the, the program where it doesn't align um, to align better with the report recommendations. The second piece is to potentially proviso the proposed funds um, and prohibit expenditure until law provides that kind of reporting um, or uh, proviso the proposed funds to mandate that the funds could only be used to support a prevailing diversion uh, program that does align with the principles laid out. Um, or the, the council could take no action and just allow the funding to move forward. Regarding the funding source, um, the there are a couple options laid out here. Um, and for this first option A, um, you could just cut the funds um, in the budget and not sta add staff at all if you wanted to use those funds for other council priorities. Option B is to cut the general fund allocation and replace it with existing funds and staff from the police department, other places in law's criminal division or the Seattle Municipal Court. Um, and I wanted to provide a little more context about this particular option. Um, I'm currently working with the city attorney's office to figure out if there are existing ways to reallocate funds that are currently within the criminal division um, into pre-filing diversion. But there are a couple considerations um, that relate to how staffing works. Um, the first is something that's within the council's purview to some extent. Um, the number of cases and charges that come into the system are predicated on the things that are, the behaviors that are criminalized as misdemeanors within the Seattle Municipal Code. And so to the extent that council has the jurisdiction to decriminalize some of these things, um, that could potentially cut down on the number of uh, reports and arrests that are even coming into the system. I'll note that there are limitations in terms of what council can do in this regard because so many of the crimes that are um, listed as misdemeanors are state level crimes. And so the council doesn't necessarily have the jurisdiction to change um, what is at the state level a crime um, at the city level. But there are things here and there that the council can do. A recent example is um, the ways in which the council decriminalized um, drug and prostitution loitering. And so um, if there are additional crimes that could be um, moved out of the code, that could potentially decrease the number of cases coming in. The other issue that relates to freeing up capacity in the, uh, the city attorney's office would be around how a city attorney chooses to handle um, reports that are coming into the office. On the one hand, if a city attorney were to decline to charge any of those cases, um, there wouldn't even be an option of um, 
moving that case forward into choosing to prosecute or to divert, they would just be declining charges altogether. And that would decrease um, the ability, excuse me, decrease the number of cases that a potential prosecutor would move forward with for charging, um, decreasing the need potentially for prosecutors across the system. Um, the other, the other item of note would be if the um, the a future city attorney decided to divert a higher number of cases, so expanding eligibility or um, increasing overall the cases that moved into a diversion program. Um, that could also potentially free up, free up a prosecutor that would otherwise be um, pursuing those charges in court and provide for that prosecutor moving into prefiling diversion. So all that to say, I am still working with the city attorney's office to figure out what that kind of staffing looks like um, and would hopefully have more information about that um, as the, the analysis continues. And so those are the, the pieces related to um, how to fund the existing program. I'll stop right there um, for any questions before moving into the next issue, which is also related to prefiling diversion, but um, on the expansion piece. Thank you. I see Councilmember Herbold and then Councilmember Lewis. Councilmember Herbold, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, just for uh, everybody's situational awareness, as um, as as is said sometimes, um, and because we are our timelines are short, I just want to um, surface that of the pre-filing diversion um, actions that um, Asha is covering here. Um, well, actually, there's there's. There's more, but between this one and the next one, I I do not have a city um, a council budget action related to fully staffing the existing pre-filing diversion program. Um, I um, I do have so if somebody's interested in taking that on, um, I I just want to let folks know that that is not something that I'm moving for. Not not because I'm not interested in, and I absolutely am, but because. Um, for the um, expansion of the pre-filing diversion program to um, people over 25, that was um, work that I've just been engaged in because of um, efforts from Council President Gonzalez a couple of years ago and a slide report coming to my committee on the uh, racial equity toolkit that we had asked them to do. So I've just been a little bit more engaged in um, and, and have actually, you know, actually requested that the law department make a proposal for um, the uh, pre-filing diversion program to be expanded to, to um, over 25 year olds. So I do have a proposal around that, but not about this one. So I just, just want one folks to know in case um, you're interested in the options that um, Asha is proposing. Thank you for that preview, Councilmember Herbold. Appreciate the heads up on that. Uh, Councilmember Lewis, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. It, it, and I am um, uh, similar to Councilmember Herbold's comments. I don't really uh, at this point have anything to weigh in on the options that have been um, put up here. I just want to comment on a more fundamental level that you know, there is going to be a change um, in leadership in the city attorney's office uh, after this next election. And I do think a lot of these questions and, you know, Asha, I don't know what your conversations have been like with the current city attorney's office in terms of trying to predict out um, how to get some of the information you're requesting, because a lot of it is, is sort of going to be contingent on what direction the new city attorney wants to take to a certain extent. I, I did just want to flag here an interest that I have um, in you know, using our powers under the charter to uh, create um, legislation, creating a duty for the city attorney to maintain um, a diversion program uh, as a fundamental part, uh, like item of business that we do. And that at this point, it shouldn't be frankly discretionary for diversion to be part of that work. Uh, we've seen uh, over the last couple of years, and I've worked directly with uh, the Choose 180 Prefile Diversion Program, um, the incredible results of that program um, as demonstrated in a very, very low uh, recidivism rate uh, for people that participate in that program, um, as demonstrated by um, the very strong community partnerships uh, between, um, uh, you know, Choose 180 and the city government and uh, 
really fundamentally changing at the core of uh, our legal system to being, you know, more restorative, restorative rather than being more punitive. And, you know, I, I think it's too important to be in a position where a city attorney could just by their discretion um, get out of that line of business and stop doing pre-file diversion as part of the practice. So, you know, I, I do think we, I mean, we have the power under the charter to create affirmative duties for the city attorney. Uh, I think that we should exercise um, that power, uh, given that we are going to be for the first time in 12 years uh, transitioning and for the first time with the life of pre-file diversion as a concept, transitioning leadership in that department, um, just to make it clear that this is something the city will continue to do and, and give um, some peace of mind to community stakeholders that that program is not just going to be uh, arbitrarily washed away. Um, uh, in, in the event that there's a city attorney that doesn't believe in pre-file diversion or or um, doesn't think it should be part of, of their business. So I just wanted to flag that um, as something I'm interested in and and, and flag it to give some uh, maybe some relief to our community partners who are potentially concerned uh, that this could all just go away um, based on that change in leadership. Thank you very much, Councilmember Lewis. Appreciate appreciate that concept. And um, Asha, do you have anything else that you'd like to go through on this slide? Uh, not on this slide. Um, I'll note that many of the considerations and much of what we've just discussing will apply to the next slide, um, which is about expanding pre-filing diversion. Okay, let's go ahead and go to that one. We have about uh, five more minutes. And if we can't get through it, then we will do a pause at one o'clock. Uh, thanks, Patty. Um, so as it currently stands, the 2022 proposed budget does not include any funds for uh, expanding the pre-filing diversion program. Um, but in the consideration of expansion, as Councilmember Herbold mentioned, um, there was a sly response as well as a uh, RET that happened. Um, they did were able to estimate that the cost of such a program would be $1.4 million. Um, $750,000 would go directly to supporting a community partner and about $680,000 would go towards supporting staffing in the city attorney's office. And so, um, as I mentioned, um, there are options around potentially um, figuring out how these align with the recommendations that came out of the task force report and the RET. Um, so option A is to do, uh, adopt a slide that would require law to submit a report um, about the alignment of principles and how they would design that program. Um, option B would be to add the funds to expand pre-filing diversion um, and either do it without a proviso, um, with a proviso that requires the funds be spent um, on a program that aligns with the principles in the task force report in the RET or with the proviso to prohibit expenditure until a report came in um, that describes alignment or see that the council could take no action. Um, and then similar to the considerations um, I mentioned above about the existing pre-filing diversion program, uh, when it comes to funding source, you could either add, option A is to add general fund to provide the staffing and support needed to expand the program. Uh, option B would be to reallocate funds already within the system. Um, so either from the police department, other places in uh, the city attorney's offices, criminal division or the Seattle Municipal Court um, to fund the program or C, you could take no action, which would mean um, not expanding the, not providing funds and staffing to expand the uh, pre-filing diversion program. Thank you. Any initial comments or um, questions on item 1B here. Okay, um, Asha, tell me more about what, and this might not be a simple answer, but what would it look like to make some of the policy changes outlined in, outlined in the central staff memo instead of expanding the city attorney's budget? Have, have we done that sort of analysis? Um, so I think the challenge is that by expanding the um, expanding the 
policy pieces and eligibility of the program, it'll mean more cases coming in. And so that sort of automatically ups the amount of the body of work um, that the city attorney's office would need to do. Um, and given that the existing program isn't fully staffed in a way to do all, both the, the work of diversion generally, as well as some of the reform work um, that the current lead prosecutor has been doing in terms of participating in work groups around jail use, around um, criminal legal system, um, efforts otherwise it would it might be difficult to for the city attorney's office to handle um, the influx in case volume that comes without additional staffing um, the the funding that would go to a community program to be able to do this work um, in the same way um, I don't know that they would have the capacity to take on the additional volume of cases that would come with expansion um, so even if we were to make the policy changes um, and the city attorney's office were to expand um, diversion, I think it would be difficult for them to actually handle the, the practicalities of that level of case volume. Um, Council Member Herbal. Yeah, I just want to clarify. I, I, what I, I think I heard you say, Asha, is uh, more cases will come in, be coming in. Not, not that more cases will be coming into the law department for prosecution, but more cases, there'll be more cases eligible for diversion. Those diversion cases are, are, they're, staff in this in the city attorney's office manage those cases through the diversion program and so i think that's why um you know when we're referring to these principles from the uh criminal legal um system task force there are a number of principles the the preference is not to ex um expand the funding footprint for um components of the cls the city attorney being one of them, but in those cases when you might be doing so, the preference is that you take money from other places in the CLS. So that's why under um, option B, it's a recognition that you may need to add funding to uh, the CAO, but you should take it from somewhere else within um, within the CLS, the criminal legal system. Uh, as far as, and then there's a, there's a, there's a community component, co uh, community stakeholder funding component also uh, for some of the programmatics that that needs, that does not need to be held in the, um, in the city attorney's office. Thank you. Thank you both for that clarification. And with that, um, I think I would be leaning towards option two, option B2 um, you know, to make sure that there is alignment with those recommendations. Councilmember Lewis, to close us out on this item, unless Councilmember Herbold, you had something else? Okay, great, I see your hand go down. Um, Councilmember Lewis, let's close this out on this slide if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I, I similarly uh, concur with Councilmember Herbold and, um, and Madam Chair, your, your preferences in regard to how to proceed with this. I mean, I guess one thing that I would flag uh, based on my personal experience is that I do firmly believe that over the course of a couple of budget cycles, if there is a pre-file diversion expansion, um, there will be a, um, an efficiency realized uh, in the criminal division of the city attorney's office in terms of freeing up um, um, additional time by, uh, by reducing uh, the amount of uh, employee hours required to process a similar number of cases. Uh, diversion work is considerably less time consuming than um, uh, adversarial criminal litigation. And as, the, uh, as that is expanded, I think there'll, there'll be some corresponding savings that could be captured and reinvested um, in other city priorities. I guess what, what I would like to do is figure out a way that we can structure a way to monitor the increased efficiencies and the um, uh, the reduced demand, uh, and then have that be part of what we do over a series of budget cycles. Um, that you know, I, similar to how we are um, interacting with the police department, as Councilmember Herbold indicated earlier, you know, you don't want to be in a position, which has been the council's position, um, of of cutting before those capacity efficiencies are realized, which, you know, of course this council hasn't actually done despite misconceptions in the community, but uh, to, to reduce some of the functions in the city attorney's office before those efficiencies are realized could be problematic. 
Um, but I think that by monitoring and uh, having a stated budgetary goal of um, over time, expanding diversion and then reducing the overall footprint of the criminal division um, is something that can be and will be realized by increasing and expanding diversion. So just some way that to structure and track that so in future budgets we can continue that work. Okay, thank you very much for that comment and, and uh, appreciate and agree with that sentiment that we need to um, appropriately scale and, and thank you for the clarification colleagues on this piece. I am going to suggest that we take a pause. We come back, Asha, sorry to interrupt the flow here. We do have um, a few more slides to go, about five more slides. So we'll come back and we'll start again on slide 15, unless there's any additional questions or comments on this one. Madam Clerk, I would like to, um, uh, I would like to give folks a full hour. So uh, if there's no objection, tell me, Madam Clerk, if I'm saying this uh, appropriately in terms of process, if there's no objection, I'd like to amend the agenda to have our recess um, uh, end at 2.05 p.m. Is there any objection to amending the agenda to have a full hour recess to return at 2.05 p.m.? Hearing no objection, the agenda is amended. We will have a full hour. Thank you all for joining us again to continue uh, the alternative responses and then leading right into SPD. We'll make sure to get you out of here before 5 p.m. tonight. Thanks for all your time and questions. The meeting is in recess. See you at 2.05 p.m.